In 1997, world-famous fashion designer Gianni Versace was gunned down in the street. It was the culmination of a three-month, two and a half thousand mile rampage. I quickly realized that this was much, much bigger than anything we had ever dealt with. As the clock ticked, the body count rose. He was like right there, boom. It was horrifying. Even 16 years doesn't change things. And with it, the question, why had Andrew Cunanan, a good-looking and popular young man, embarked on this devastating killing spree? To think that Andrew killed Gianni Versace was just about the most preposterous thing that anybody could ever tell you. In 1997, Miami, Florida, a city enjoying a renaissance after a period of decline, the neighborhood of South Beach leading the way, a new reputation as a flamboyant and glitzy playground for the clubbers, fashionistas and playboys of any sexual orientation was developing. Innocence and South Beach do not go hand in hand. I mean, it was a place where people hooked up. And it was a wild scene. 1997, Miami Beach was a very up-and-coming place. South Beach had been discovered in the early 90s, and uh, people were starting to flock to Miami Beach. It was like the place to be. People were paying big money for rooms that were once a uh, dollar a night. There were hundreds of dollars a night. So it, it was a big change in this area. It became the, the, the mecca for, for modeling. It became the mecca for um, the, the, the designers coming down from, from New York, from Europe. And this was where, you know, this was happening. It was right here. Miami was made desirable by one man in particular, Gianni Versace. Versace was a household name in the fashion industry. He dressed everyone from the opera stars to the film stars to royalty. He was, without doubt, the most famous fashion designer in the world. Gianni Versace was famous for his fashion design, but here in Miami Beach, he was famous just for being Versace. I mean, where he went, people took notice. He was part of the glamour and glitz that was becoming South Beach. Gianni was a, a regular. Um, uh, whenever he was in town, he was here about every day to get his newspapers um, and, and a cup of coffee. Uh, the Versace mansion is about four blocks away, about a three, three minute walk. Everybody that, you know, came, they always wanted to see the house and the, the house that Versace built. One such onlooker was 27 year old Andrew Cunanan. <laughs> 8.40 a.m. July the 15th, 1997. South Beach was waking to another perfect morning. Within half an hour, one of the world's most brutal spree killers would claim his highest profile victim yet. The day is a day you never forget. It's early morning, Miami Beach. There are joggers about. A few news vendors have set up stalls. Versace uh, had come in for his newspapers, and I said, good day, and he said, good day, and he left and went home. 8.55 a.m. Cunanan had spotted his prey. He's already decided what he's going to do. He's got the gun in his pocket. He's not drunk. He's not high on drugs. He's just high on what he's about to do. Before Versace reached the safety of his home, the killer made his move. Versace was allowing himself into his own gated quarters. He snuck up behind him and shot him at point blank range. Shot. 
Well, it was something like something out of the movies, you know? He was just, uh, he was gunned down right on his steps. There was uh, blood everywhere. Mr. Versace was laying there on the steps. Uh, there was magazines that he was holding in his hand on the floor. Uh, we had bullet casings. In the chaotic aftermath, Cunanan escaped. Once uh, Mr. Versace was shot, the killer fled northbound on Ocean Drive. He came running right behind me. He went right across the street into the parking lot. A policeman on a bicycle came right by. I hadn't even moved from where I was standing. And um, he asked if I had seen you know, Mr. Versace. I said, yeah, he just left. And I said, why? And he says, something terrible happened. It didn't take long for the celebrity murder in Miami to become breaking news. This whole area was filled with the satellite TV dishes, uh, dozens of them. I've never seen anything like it before or, or since. And it soon began to emerge that Versace was victim number five of a killing spree that had begun three months earlier at the opposite end of the country. I quickly realized that this was much, much bigger than anything we had ever dealt with in Miami Beach. Despite the global spotlight, days after the Versace murder, Andrew Cunanan was nowhere to be found. How did an infamous rampage killer end up in Miami on that hot summer day? And how did a boy from San Diego suburb grow into America's most wanted man? Miami, Florida, and the brutal slaying of fashion designer Gianni Versace has rocked America. He is the latest victim of a three-month, five-state bloody rampage. What had driven Andrew Cunanan to commit his killing spree? And as the Miami police tracked him in the aftermath of the Versace murder, would they catch him before he killed again? 9.41 p.m., August the 31st, 1969. National City, California. Andrew Cunanan was born the youngest of four. Indulged by his parents, Cunanan was brought up in modest surroundings to a Filipino father and devoutly religious mother in a crime-ridden suburb of San Diego County. They were not of, of terrific means by any, any stretch of the imagination. Uh, Pete Cunanan, his father, was a, was a stockbroker. His mother, uh, Marianne Cunanan, she was a bit of a doting mother. It was only when his mother, Marianne, inherited some money from her father that the family were able to afford to move slightly upmarket to an area that wasn't as dangerous, wasn't as dirty. From the start, his father, in particular, encouraged the young Andrew to be status conscious and instilled in him a sense of self-confidence that would last a lifetime. Andrew Cunanan's first day at high school was not in rough National City, but in one of California's wealthiest seaside communities. Like many immigrant parents, they wanted their son to have a better life than they had had in the home country and they were willing to sacrifice and be sort of submissive and subservient to Andrew so that he could have the lifestyle that they, they would wish for their progeny. The esteemed bishops was one of the country's top college prep schools and a breeding ground for future movers and shakers. I remember Andrew uh, at bishops. I remember hearing his laugh and we immediately hit it off. He was, uh, he was really kind of a card. He was determined that his classmates who came from rich families wouldn't know how poor his own family was. Cunanan's school fees were in fact stretching his parents' finances to the limit. And that meant that he created more and more uh, stories about himself and tried to give the impression that he came from the sort of high, upper-class family that, of course, he didn't come from. Andrew lived in a bit of a fantasy world. For example, he pretended like uh, he was Sebastian from Brideshead Revisited. Uh, he'd carry a teddy bear around campus. 
this need to conceal and to act, basically, and be on stage uh, all the time continued through the end of our friendship at Bishop's. Cunanan's charisma and good looks were powerful, and he wasn't afraid to use either. He had the ability to charm, and he became quite a manipulative young man. The warning signs of the man Andrew Cunanan was to become were already there. His psychopathic tendencies started at that early age because he became adept at being a shallow face, a different persona for what the situation required. Andrew had a, a gay veneer. Um, that was part of his uh, um, persona. Uh, so the uh, effeminate uh, or um, androgynous even, perhaps, uh, look that he had was all designed to, to convey the impression, I think, that he was gay. If you think about um, Andrew taken to his logical conclusion, Liberace comes to mind. Elton John comes to mind. He was basically the center of the universe on campus. Uh, he was a giant explosion of personality. But soon, the stage at Bishop's wasn't enough for Andrew Cunanan. After graduation, Cunanan gravitated towards the predominantly homosexual neighborhood of Hillcrest in San Diego. The Hillcrest area is very lively. It's a great place to be uh, gay, and at the time was a sensational um, opportunity for anybody uh, coming from anywhere else in the country to uh, be out and proud. Hungry for the high life and worshiping fame and celebrity, he began dating wealthy older men who provided for him. Andrew loved that freedom and uh, reveled in in the opportunity to uh, parade young men, old men, uh, all sorts of uh, companions. Andrew Cunanan had years of successfully negotiating his way through Californian high society, thanks to the patronage of his sugar daddies and well-meaning friends. Andrew Cunanan actually used um, being gay as a way to climb a social ladder through his ability to seduce or be seduced by older men in powerful jobs. He seemed to have quite a bit of money. Oftentimes would pull a nice fat wad of cash out, uh, buy drinks for everybody at the bar. Uh, he didn't hold a job to the best of our knowledge. He had a nice car that he would drive around. He wore very nice clothes, always put together well. For almost 10 years, he had enjoyed being a fixture in the San Diego gay community, a charmer who talked big and partied hard. Andrew was a showman. He had a story for everything. He had a hellacious little laugh. It's somewhere along the lines of a, of a belt of a hyena, perhaps getting poked in the rear with a pin. We'll give it a ha, 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 ha,
the one he called the love of his life. Dave was an architect. He had a nice demeanor. It was all American. Uh, Kellogg's cornflakes box grin. Uh, quite an easy going good guy. Cunanan felt abandoned. He saw the friendship between Trail and Madsen as the ultimate betrayal. The happier they seemed, the angrier Cunanan became. He wanted a confrontation. Cunanan prepared to leave San Diego by holding a final get-together with his friends, an event that has since been dubbed the Last Supper. Andrew had a very unique personality. Uh, he was quite a grandstander. He was uh, one to uh, leap up from the table if anybody should join the table, introduce him with first and last names. He was uh, a gregarious individual. He would always insist on being placed in the front room, which looked out onto the street, so that he could see and be seen. The usual life and soul of the party was uncharacteristically subdued. It was not a typical uh, a showman's uh, dinner table. He didn't leap up, he didn't chase people around. He was uh, soft-spoken, thoughtful, contemplative, perhaps. Uh, befitting of the occasion. Cunanan claimed he wanted a new start. Instead, it was the beginning of the end. April the 25th, 1997, Minneapolis, Minnesota. And Cunanan arrives from San Diego for a weekend stay at Madsen's apartment. Madsen picked him up from the airport. Many people were concerned and warned Madsen that Cunanan didn't seem himself. He said that he just needed to sort himself out and needed a place to stay. Jennifer Weiberg was the caretaker of Harmony Lofts in Minneapolis, where David Madsen lived. I actually encountered David Madsen and his friend that he introduced me to, who was Andrew. Andrew was non-responsive. David seemed rather irritated that he was being so aloof. I saw this kind of puffy guy with an attitude that I can't see why, how or why anyone would ever have been impressed with him or wanting to hang out with him. Sometime on Sunday the 27th of April, something had finally pushed Cunanan to the point of no return. Bitter with betrayal and driven by jealousy, a vicious argument ensued between Jeffrey Trail, David Madsen and Andrew Cunanan with fatal consequences. Cunanan found a claw hammer in that apartment and started bludgeoning Jeffrey Trail. Following this attack, Cunanan calmly rolls Jeffrey Trail's body up in a rug and pushes it unceremoniously behind a sofa as if no one would find it. Some spree killers who are killing in a state of frenzy uh, aren't interested in hiding the evidence. After two days holed up in the apartment and with no apparent plan of what to do next, Cunanan fled the gruesome scene with Madsen. Cunanan's spontaneous murder of Trail happened so quickly that Madsen was unable to comprehend what had happened or to even intervene. That's the kind of thing that psychopaths are able to do with their powers of persuasion. A few days later, Jennifer Weiberg received some worrying news. Tuesday I came home and there were two messages on my voicemail from co-workers of David Matson, and they were very concerned because he had not shown up for work and people were looking for him. Knocked on the door. David, David, are you in there? Are you in there? And no sounds. So I did have a master key and I opened the door. It was horrifying. She didn't know it at the time, but what she had discovered was the beginning of one of America's most famous spree killings. Jeffrey Trail had become Andrew Cunanan's first victim. 
May the 2nd, Rush City, Shiseido County. I was on patrol in the morning and I got a call from our dispatchers. They told me to meet uh, two fishermen. They were scouting an area to put a tent so they could come up to fish the next weekend. And when they looked down by the lake, they saw what they thought was a body. This is the crime scene. The fisherman stopped right about here and just pointed down toward the lake where they said the body was. He was like right there, boom. So we didn't know who, the, who we had here until we put out a uh, teletype to uh, surrounding agencies that we had an unidentified deceased white male. And Minneapolis police called us back shortly thereafter and said that they were looking for a person that matched that description by the name of Dave Madsen. David Madsen was now victim number two. Police on the scene pieced together how events unfolded. They drove their car down the hill together, and David was still alive at the time. They turned this way and then backed in here and had a conversation in this area for some time. At some point in the conversation, David must have realized that um, he was in some sort of trouble with, with Mr. Cunanan, and, and so he jumped out of the car and ran this direction. Andrew Cunanan shot him in the back. He fell face down onto the ground, at which time Andrew Cunanan turned him over and shot him. You think you know somebody? The person we thought we knew was uh, long gone. Less than a week after leaving his ex-lover dead in Rush City, Cunanan's rampage gathered pace and took him 450 miles southeast to Chicago and to the door of 72-year-old property millionaire Lee Miglin and his most vicious slaughter so far. Andrew Cunanan's killing spree had begun in Minneapolis, where he had bludgeoned to death his first victim, Jeffrey Trail. 60 miles north, and former lover David Madsen had lost his life on the banks of Rush Lake. Now Cunanan's rampage would take an even darker turn. May the 3rd, Chicago, Illinois. Lee Miglin was a wealthy property developer, well respected and well recognized in the city. No one is sure what drove Cunanan to his door, although some speculate that they had met years before in California. Whatever Cunanan's motivation, revenge, retribution, or simply robbery, at some point over that May weekend, Miglin succumbed to what his elderly mother described as a worse death than Christ. Cunanan overpowered Mr. Miglin, tied him up, put a sheet over him and tortured him. This was a very cruel death. In fact, in some ways, much crueler than the death of his two friends earlier. The way that Cunanan killed Mr. Miglin is quite different from how spree killers often kill their victims. This was not an indiscriminate shooting. This took thought and he took pleasure from this and he engaged in overkill. He'd now crossed the Rubicon and was killing for the pleasure. Lee Miglin had become Andrew Cunanan's third victim. And now the FBI had entered the chase. Three dead bodies had earned Cunanan the label armed and extremely dangerous. He continued to evade capture, despite the trace on Miglin's car phone. Cunanan takes off in Miglin's Lexus. Um, police are able to establish the movement of the car through its um, phone, which Cunanan has started using. A countrywide APB had been issued for Cunanan's arrest. Radio News reported that the killer was traveling in Miglin's distinctive Lexus. Cunanan needed another vehicle at any cost. May the 8th, Pennsville, New Jersey. 765 miles from Chicago. A resting place for hundreds of Civil War soldiers and a hiding place for a spree killer on the run. Fence Point was so secluded uh, miles and miles off of the main highway that drove through that, through that area. Fence Point Cemetery is normally very 
quiet and peaceful. Cemetery caretaker William Reese had worked at Finns Point for 15 years. Bill and I did a lot of stuff together. Uh, we hung out together, performed Civil War reenactments and long drives, long talks. Bill was a very uh, special person. He was kind, a uh, very dedicated person also. He, he, uh, he, he, would, he was very faithful. He would be here right at 8 o'clock in the morning, and he would spend a full day here. Bill was just a part of us. Bill was, was there for us, and we were there for Bill. We were more like siblings than, than we were, you know, uh, workers. Enormously funny, and a laugh that was infectious beyond words. He was, uh, and his face lit up when he laughed. It was a cool, dark day that I remember, and, and it was, uh, it, you know, I, I had to, uh, when I left, I, I don't know why I had a feeling, but I had a feeling there was something wrong. I was sitting in the living room, and my wife and kids were on the couch. It was near evening. Um, uh, Bill's brother, Bob, called, and I answered the phone, and Bob said, I don't know how to say this, but Bill was shot and killed. Um, and then just kind of went numb. Cemetery caretaker William Reese had become Cunanan's fourth victim. As William Reese is locking up for the day, Cunanan stops his car, jumps out, and asks William Reese if he could possibly let him have a glass of water because he's not feeling very well. <laughs> William Reese invites Cunanan in, but within seconds, Cunanan's pulled out Jeffrey Trail's gun and shot William Reese dead with just one bullet. Where Bill was murdered was in the basement of the house. I haven't been into that building since this happened. Um, I don't think I could go back into that building after Bill was, was shot and killed there. Even 16 years doesn't change things. <sighs> Bill was not just a victim. He was not just a, um, a cemetery caretaker. He was loved, he loved the family, he loved people. Bill was a human being. <sighs> Huge void in the family. Andrew Cunanan had gone from killing friends to murdering strangers in cold blood. This time there was no torture. This time it was a quick death. It's like Cunanan was trying to use different modus operandi to perhaps challenge the agents who were chasing him. No one knew where Cunanan would strike next, what was driving him, and who would be his next victim. May the 12th, 1997. Andrew Cunanan had arrived in Miami, Florida. He was getting ready to shock a generation. Miami was the perfect place to harbor a chameleon like Cunanan. You know, every killer who commits multiple homicide has a comfort zone. Uh, most spree killers uh, don't travel. Uh, they stay within their own community because they know that place, they understand it better, and they're able to get away with murder. There are exceptions. Andrew Cunanan was no multiple personality, but he had a skill that very few people do have, and that is he could change his appearance to look like dozens of other people. Cunanan is America's most wanted man. 
yet he hides in plain sight. He makes no attempt to disguise himself. He makes no attempt to hide out in, in the latest car he's stolen. It's hard to say if Kananen was asking to be caught, but I certainly think he was asking to have a showdown. He was asking to have his day of glory. He'd paid for a month's rent in advance, staying at the Normandy Plaza, a once swish hotel in the 50s. And he was living in plain sight around the beaches of Miami. He needed some funds and he decided to go to a pawn shop where he would exchange one of the gold coins he took from Mr. Miglin's house for $200 cash. He was obliged to provide two pieces of ID. The only ID he had was his real name and the real address where he was staying at the Normandy Plaza, which he gave. Yet again, Cunanan had taken a risk and got away with it. The pawn shop passed on the forms as required to the Miami police where they lay on a desk unnoticed. There was really nobody looking for him here. Nobody thought he was here. He really was here out and about like a normal citizen, uh, minding his own business for, for at least two months that we know. Andrew Cunanan lived and loitered in Miami until the middle of July. Now he was ready to claim the most famous victim of his notorious spree. During Cunanan's heyday in San Diego, he was often heard boasting about his time spent with famous fashion designer Gianni Versace. Andrew had always talked about celebrities that he rubbed elbows with that he couldn't wait to tell us about his chance encounter and meeting fashion designer Gianni Versace. We laughed and we said, well, good for you, isn't that, isn't that something? Another tall tale? Did he really meet him? Did they hang out in the limo and club it all night? Maybe yes, maybe no. It could be seen perhaps that Cunanan targeted Versace because it was an argument, it was an element of self-loathing against being homosexual and the gay community that he'd now turned against. There was also the belief that Cunanan thought he had HIV and he wanted to take it out on a, on, a, on a symbolism for the homosexual culture. Versace would be an ideal target that would bring everything together in one tumultuous storm. At 8.55 a.m., Andrew Cunanan shot dead one of the world's most famous fashion designers at point-blank range. Cunanan was now the most wanted man in the world, and a massive police hunt had begun. The clues weren't hard to find. William Reese's truck had been left in a nearby car park. We discovered that the clothes that the witnesses had described was laying on the ground next to the truck. And he went out the fire exit and got into a taxi cab and fled before we were able to secure that garage. The impact of the Versace slaying continued to grow. It was a big deal that this was not just some, you know, random celebrity. This was a this was going to be international news. This was going to turn the city upside down. And it did. When I ran by that day, I looked over to the east here, and I just saw these new satellite dishes all over the place, maybe, uh, I'd say dozens of them. I managed, you know, to kind of run by and see the blood on the steps, because everybody talked about the blood on the steps, and it stayed there for a long time. Played out in the spotlight of rolling news, the global media soaked up the breaking story. We quickly shut down the city before Andrew Cunanan was able to leave, so we were fairly convinced that he was still in Miami Beach. It was a huge manhunt. Everything stopped in Miami. Everything was focused on this manhunt, and everybody descended upon South Beach. International news, and we uh, basically uh, stayed at the police station, you know, 24-7. It was just crazy. I mean, it, it was it became a media circus. I mean, the police were coming in, asking questions. Um, it, was, it was so much activity 
on Ocean Drive and the cameras and, and, the, and the people, and, and there was still the fear. The warmth of the Miami streets was replaced by cold dread and panic. Well, we didn't know what happened. We don't know why it happened, if it was random or the guy knew him. There's a lot of uncertainty. You know, people were worried about, is there a killer on the street? Um, you know, if he was shot, are they going to come shoot other people? It was, it, was, it was scary. We all had the news on. Then all of a sudden, I hear that he's killed other gay people in different cities. A lot of the gay people felt they were in danger from him, that he'll kill others. You know, people were just, like, on edge the whole time. By murdering one of the most famous people in the world, Cunanan was now going to be headline news in every sense of the world. As the world watched on, could Cunanan be caught before he killed again? In 1997, a vicious spree killer had been terrorizing America on a 2,000 mile, three month, bloody rampage. Andrew Cunanan had just claimed his fifth victim gunning down the world-famous fashion designer Gianni Versace on the steps of his South Beach mansion in broad daylight. You couldn't pick somebody more important to a person like Andrew, and yet, at his own hand, he saw his demise. But eight days after the murder, the trail had gone cold. Putting his face out there was a difficult task. I remember we came up with a photo lineup of about six different Andrew Cunanan, and we put it out on a poster for the media to help assist us with locating him, and that's how the leads came in. It was just a, a massive manhunt, and it was almost unfathomable that he could not find this guy. Yet, he was such a chameleon and blended in so well that there was more than one or two times that I thought I saw him. Uh, was it him? I don't know. The day I saw Cunan and the beach was really kind of empty, nobody around, and this one guy was sitting on the rail. And he was just sitting there staring at me for a good 15 minutes, 20 minutes. It was kind of eerie in a way. So I opened my window and I said, you have a freaking problem? <laughs> and he just looked at me and then he walked away. And uh, when I went home that night, I uh, looked on Channel 7 News, and I looked and I saw, and that's when I knew it was him. His head was shaved, so he didn't look like the picture in the paper. So that's why I didn't recognize him. Wednesday, the 23rd of July, 1997, Ocean Drive, Miami. Time was running out for Cunanan. Caretaker Fernando Carrera had stopped by to check on a vacant Indian Creek houseboat moored two and a half miles from Versace's mansion on Ocean Drive. He had stumbled across an unwelcome house guest. This was where Andrew Cunanan had sought refuge. I don't think that there was any attempt from Cunanan to move out of Florida. He stayed hiding in a, in, a, in a broken houseboat that he'd found whilst the owner was away. He was almost making his last stand. But I don't think he had much faith that the police would catch up with him because he had a very low opinion of law enforcement. They were clearly inferior to him and they'd not done a very good job of catching up with him so far. As Carrera ran to alert the authorities, a shot rang out. When that call came in, it was a shots fired call. Everybody just knew this had to be it. The authorities respond incredibly quickly this time and are swarming all around the houseboat within minutes of being alerted to it by the caretaker. I was there on the island when they finally cornered him at the, at the houseboat. And when I got there, there was, I don't know, hundreds and hundreds of people there, hundreds and hundreds of reporters, police, all around this houseboat. After a, a standoff of a couple of hours, during which there's no reaction from Coon Annan, they decide to lob uh, tear gas into the, into the vessel. 
was live media coverage, you know, 24-7 almost. Everyone was glued to the news. It was crazy to watch. We were watching that on TV, kind of, you know, sitting in the, in the uh, conference room watching that on TV as it unfolded because uh, we didn't know how it was going to end at that time. The nightmare ended, caught on a thousand cameras in the full glare of the media spotlight. Myself and an FBI agent were the first ones inside. He hadn't shot at the caretaker. He had killed himself. Cunanan's death. He shot himself before the police could get to him, and he shot himself wearing a pair of shorts in a double bed with a single gunshot to the right side of his head. He was in control over how he would go. Nobody else was going to take his life or take his liberty, and he chose a very Hollywood, glamorous, almost homoerotic way to die. The reign of terror brought upon us by Andrew Cunanan is over. I'm exhausted. I'm, I, the adrenaline has been pumping for hours, and uh, I'm realizing that this story that we've basically been living with is, is over. I think he was on a suicidal rampage to begin with. I think Cunanan had intended from the beginning to kill himself. But first, he was going to get even with all those wealthy men and those concepts of wealthy men, like Versace. The kind of things Andrew wished for, the kind of places that he put himself, the kind of stories he told us, they were stories of somebody else's life, somebody that I guess we'll never know. Cunanan's death brought with it a mix of emotions for those who had been affected by his brutal spree. We were not unhappy that Cunanan committed suicide and that we did not have to go to trial and, and listen to the lies and, and the other kinds of things. Andrew Cunanan was a man that caused misery for many people. Everybody was pretty uh, relieved that he wasn't on the loose anymore. Well, I'm thankful that the taxpayers are not keeping him alive in prison. Andrew Cunanan had journeyed from being his father's precocious protege to the class clown with a fabricated family background, to the enigmatic life and soul of every party he attended, and finally, to one of the most brutal spree killers in American history. Andrew Cunanan had to be the center of attention. In his school yearbook, next to his picture, he prophetically wrote, Après moi le déluge, simply put, after me, the storm. Yet the question remained, why did Andrew Cunanan have murder in mind? And what drove him to his killing spree? Andrew was over the top in every way. He was over the top in his affect, his personality, and he was over the top when it came to killing. Well, Andrew Cunanan was a, a, a unique spree killer. He had created a false identity. He had created a false image in his mind. And when that shattered, he shattered. And he kind of left pieces of himself as he went from murder to murder to murder. He couldn't handle the fact that he'd once been the glamorous doyen of the gay party circuit, and now he was alone, putting on weight, slowly losing his hair, and possibly had HIV. He was clearly very angry, but he wasn't to blame, and other people were going to pay the price. by killing a well-known celebrity like Versace and then committing suicide, uh, Cunanan was assured of having his place in infamy. And that's exactly what he wanted. In 2013, a killing spree would unfold in California that would grip the United States. Deputies say the killer could be anywhere. And grab headlines across the globe. The man who did this was a monster. Targeting his former employers at the LAPD. He was willing to do anything to kill police officers and their families and to get away. Ex-cop Christopher Dorner would embark on a vigilante mission for vengeance. He held a pistol out the window 
and fired multiple shots. As the clock ticked, the body count rose. The truck had a window down, assault rifle out of it, and started shooting. Got an officer down. And with it, the question, what could have provoked Christopher Dorner to commit his killing spree? He was going to get even through the barrel of a gun. Surrounded by the vast wilderness of the San Bernardino National Forest, the tranquil mountain town of Big Bear is one of Southern California's most popular tourist destinations. Big Bear is a great little mountain town. Big Bear and its environs, its neighbors, are a huge pine forest, essentially. We're out in the wilderness, kind of, you know? I mean, the, the, so that's what, that's what people like here. Yet on February the 12th, 2013, at the height of the normally bustling ski season, the atmosphere and peace of this picturesque resort was shattered. A manhunt underway right now for a former Los Angeles police officer accused of murdering three people. Law enforcement authorities from across the state had descended on the tranquil area as they sought a spree killer on the run. We were all on edge, you know, we're all keeping weapons by the door. People were taking uh, precautions. The lone gunman had left a trail of carnage across California's cityscape before hiding out in the mountains. Christopher Dorner was now the most wanted man in America. There is a possibility that he's out here, and that's why we're out here searching. The search involved every level of law enforcement in the United States. I would say thousands of police officers were involved. You know, this was one of the largest uh, deployments of policing agencies in my memory. The threat posed by Dorna was palpable. Any police officer that tried to arrest him or contact him would be a target. And apprehending him would be a challenge for detectives that had little precedent. Uh, Mr. Dorner's uh, military training, his police training, the type and nature of weapons that we knew that he had in his possession heightened uh, our concerns. We didn't get much sleep during that period of time. After several days spent scouring the mountains, it was believed that the elusive killer may have slipped the net. He went to ground. Didn't leave any, hit, what we call a heat signature. You, you couldn't find him. However, in the early afternoon of the 12th of February, Dorna broke cover and was reported to police, sparking fresh life into the sprawling search efforts. Locked down the mountain. We heard the broadcast over the radio that Dorner had been sighted. Threw our raid vests on and we just headed out. We knew that he had already killed multiple people. The first thing that was going through my mind is if we do find him, we were going to be involved in a shooting with him. Dorner was not rational, he was unpredictable, willing to do anything to get away. There was no question, at least in my mind, that this was going to end in more killing. Local scout camp leader Rick Helterbreak was on the mountain that day, unaware of the drama that was beginning to unfold. I came down the road, I'm just checking the perimeter, as I call it. All this right, as you see, is all my property all this stuff, so I'm checking to make sure nobody's down here, no snow players, no vehicles, basically just doing a security check. So I'm driving up here, just minding my own business, a day like any other day. 
roughly about in here someplace. I see movement up here on the left. I don't know what it is. And right about in here, I see a crashed car. At around 12.45 p.m., Rick would lay eyes on the man who was the subject of one of the nation's largest ever manhunts. Within a split second or so, seemingly, I came up and Christopher Dorner came out of the snowbank at me with a rifle pointed at me. In 1979, 34 years prior to his ruthless spree, Christopher Dorner and his family moved from New York to the middle-class neighborhood of Norwalk in Southern California. He was raised in a middle-income society, not a ghetto. Um, his family wasn't tremendously poor. Despite his tranquil suburban surroundings, from an early age, Dorner would develop the sense that the world was against him. I remember him telling me that he was the only African-American uh, child in his class or, or in his neighborhood. He would regularly get beat up after school. Uh, there were you know, other bullies in the neighborhood who would give him a hard time. To hear him tell it, it was racially motivated. At college, friends recalled Dorner as outgoing and well-educated. I met Chris Dorner in college. He and I played football together. He was clean cut, articulate, pretty easy to get along with. Um, he was approachable, good sense of humor. Um, you know, he wasn't somebody who was serious all the time. He'd laugh and smile and, you know, was no, you know, normal. I mean, he was a normal 19-year-old, 20-year-old guy. However, Dorna's habit of painting himself as a victim of prejudice would continue. He was very conscious of how people treated him. I don't think that he was all that thrilled about our coaches uh, on the football team. He commented to me that he thought that particular coach was racist. Dorna's problems with authority would continue after college. Having spent time enlisted in the Navy reserves, his tendency to blame others was again noted when he joined the LAPD. In his short time at the LAPD, uh, Christopher Dorner uh, was the center of a, of a lot of controversy. Uh, he made uh, several complaints against other officers. He saw everything that happened to him that wasn't to his liking as a consequence of his race or of some overall scheme against him. He was a troubled man. Christopher Dorner's festering resentment would eventually overwhelm him and extreme violence would be the tragic consequence. In 2013, Christopher Dorner would perpetrate a killing spree that would leave California paralyzed by fear. Law enforcement throughout Southern California is heightened and aware and concerned and scared because any one of them could have been his next target. The former LAPD man would turn fugitive and orchestrate a campaign of murder that would draw international attention and spark a massive manhunt. I think at one point in time, the, the, the rewards throughout Southern California for his apprehension um, amounted to over a million and a half dollars. The extraordinary spree would begin in puzzling circumstances. The 3rd of February, 2013, 7.30 p.m. The city of Irvine, 40 miles southeast of Los Angeles. 27-year-old Monica Kwan and her fiance, Keith Lawrence, were found slain in the parking lot at their apartment building. She was a... Uh coach in, in the school system and a, a very well uh, respected uh, individual in the community. Uh, she was engaged to Keith Lawrence. The man who did this was a monster. 
Initially, the motivation for this predatory crime seemed difficult to determine. Irvine Police Department were uh, stunned by the randomness of the selection of victims in this crime. They are uh, young people uh, with uh, no enemies, no connection to crime, no history of violence. And so detectives were, were at a loss. With police on tactical alert across this region tonight, men and women in uniform as well as the community are remembering Monica Kwan, a heartbreaking day as police search for a killer. However, in the early hours of the 4th of February, Christopher Dorner would not only claim responsibility for the killings, but announce his plans to continue his spree by targeting police officers. Holed up in an unassuming motel, Dorner posted a multi-page manifesto online. Upon discovery of the sprawling document, police began their investigation. Today, we have identified Christopher Jordan Dorner as a suspect in this double homicide. The manifesto outlined Dorner's motives. In this rambling manifesto posted on Dorner's Facebook page, he details everything. And made clear his grievances with the LAPD. Christopher Dorner had a troubled history with the Los Angeles Police Department. On his probationary period, his training officer uh, counseled him about his performance. Uh, soon after that, he made allegations uh, of excessive force against her uh, during an arrest. Uh, those allegations were not supported by witnesses or fact. And because of that, uh, Dorner charges were soon applied against Dorner, and he was terminated from the Los Angeles Police Department for being untruthful. He felt that um, because of his race in law enforcement, that that affected his uh, professional career in a detrimental way. He was an injustice collector. He was a person that believed that, that nothing that ever happened to him was as a result of his own doing. The worst thing about these setbacks for him were, because he was a narcissist, it was stripping him of everything that he held true. His identity, his service record. You take that away from a narcissist, the outer trappings of success, then there's nothing left for him to have. Vengeance is a very powerful motivation in spree killing. We see their victims, they see villains. And so they want to get even uh, through the barrel of a gun. Further reading of the sprawling document would uncover Dorna's twisted logic behind classifying Monica Kwan as a legitimate target for his vengeance. Monica Kwan is the daughter of uh, Randy Kwan, an LAPD captain, the individual who had represented him, not prosecuted him, represented him at his administrative hearing during which he was terminated, fired from the Los Angeles Police Department. Dorner decided to pick them as his avenue for revenge. The circumstances of the young couple's deaths would give investigators a chilling insight into the cold-blooded mind of Christopher Dorner. It appears that it was an ambush. Multiple rounds were fired. Uh, I doubt that either of them had any time to know what or who was happening. They were caught very off guard and basically slaughtered, executed. The victims had no opportunity to escape or respond, uh, that it was calculated. This was a crime of uh, great brutality. He claimed he was not done um, and that he was still going to uh, go after other law enforcement officers. The unique threat posed by Dorna's military training and knowledge of police tactics had officers on edge. When Christopher Dorner went on his rampage, every law enforcement agency around was aware of him. We were all on high alert. He had, you know, specialized training with, with weapons. He's aware of um, law enforcement's routines. As the investigation continued, CCTV footage emerged of Dorner dumping weapons in the aftermath of the Kwan and Lawrence murders. Staying one step ahead of the police, Dorna turned the tables on his pursuers, and the hunters would now become the hunted. 
the 7th of February, 2013, 1.45 a.m. Riverside City, California. Cab driver Karam Kaud was working the night shift. Normal evening was not that busy, just, just normal. I'm at the stop sign, like a uh, gray to blue truck. This guy, he, he ran the red light. At the same moment when I was thinking about this, I saw the police officer. I saw a truck pulling up next to the police. There is a car between them. In that car was Jack Chilson, a local resident who was also in the area. That particular night when I was going my way home, I was at a red light, and when I looked to my right, there was a police officer that pulled up in a squad car. Riverside officers Michael Crane and Andrew Takayas were out working a routine late-night patrol. Mike Crane was uh, a remarkable police officer. He had uh, about 11 years of service. In his personal life, he was the father of two children. Andy Takayas uh, was a new officer to the Riverside Police Department. Karam, Jack, and officers Crane and Takayas were about to become embroiled in the burgeoning spree. The officers and I were looking at each other, and then I seen something on peripheral vision on my left-hand side. I seen a large black male in a truck with a, an assault rifle out of his driver's window resting on the window. He starts shooting. But I'm looking to my left, watching him shooting across my hood into the uh, driver's window, side window of the police officer squad car. Opening fire on Crane and Takayas, Dorna would not discriminate when it came to dispatching violence. He had safety goggles on, and he had a grin on his face. It was like he was happy. He didn't feel sorry or anything. First of all, it's not believing what's happening. I couldn't believe it. The driver slumped forward. That's all I seen. I never seen the passenger. After he shot in, uh, the police officers, he just left. He didn't peel out. He just, like, nothing ever happened. No speeding, no nothing. Like, he took, you know, like he was going home. No emotion. With the officers helpless, their patrol car strafed with bullets, taxi driver Karam came to their aid. My feeling was, you, at that moment you don't have those feelings, you just act. I left my car and went to them. I saw the passenger police officer sitting up and Officer Taki, the wounded one, he barely like can move. And I told him, what should I do? What should I do? So he told me, the radio, the radio. So I pull it up and press the button and grab it to his mouth and he start to call. Officer shot multiple times. He cannot, he cannot move. He cannot even grab the radio. He was wounded so bad. When police support arrived on the scene of the shooting, it proved to be too late for Michael Crane. Two police officers went to his window and uh, touched his neck, I believe, and they made their head like this, that he's, he's dead. As the spree now entered its fourth day, Officer Andrew Takayas had been left critically wounded. Following the death of Michael Crane, Christopher Dorner's victims now numbered three. It's very sad, actually. It's very sad, especially you have, like, two kids and a wife. His attack on Officer Takius and, and Officer Crane uh, was cowardice. It was a blind side. It was suppressed fire. Uh, they had no idea he was even in the area. To be murdered for what you do for a living is the height of prejudice. Here's a man 
who reviled against prejudice in his manifesto. Yet he wasn't willing to kill somebody just because of what they were wearing that day, just because they were a law enforcement officer. Only hours on from the murder of Michael Crane, Christopher Dorner's spree was to hit the skids, and detectives would soon have him in their sights. We had a full perimeter around the cabin, constant exchange of gunfire, I mean, hundreds and hundreds of rounds being shot back and forth. He was like a trapped animal at that point. He was prepared for it and more than willing to, to fight. In 2013, California would be struck by a killing spree that would make waves around the world. I think during that week to 10 day period of time, I would say thousands of police officers were involved. Making his violent intentions public via an online manifesto, Christopher Dorner announced plans to target his former employers at the LAPD. He was gonna seek revenge and seek revenge in a very violent way. Four days into his spree, Dorna had claimed the lives of three. They made their head like this, that he's dead. Leaving another critically injured. His indiscriminate killings initiating a statewide climate of fear. There wasn't much rationality that you could attribute to this individual that you could say, OK, we know who's safe and who's not safe. So a very much heightened sense of danger and vulnerability with police paranoia at an all-time high, they at last got a break in the case. In a remote area um, on, a, on a dirt road, uh, his burned out truck was found. When Christopher Dorner crashed his truck up in the mountain, I think the majority of us believed he was still up there. There was an initial concern that this was bait and that Dorner was somewhere nearby ready to, to uh, snipe. People were worried. Nobody knew where he was. We were all on edge. You know, we're all keeping weapons by the door. Hopefully not that we're going to confront somebody like Christopher Dorner. The discovery was made on the edge of the mountain town of Big Bear and would mark a turning point in what had now become one of the largest manhunts in Californian history. During the actual manhunt right after Christopher Dorner's vehicle was found, there were hundreds of officers up there. All the police agencies in my county were on tactical alert, the Sheriff's Department, the Riverside Police Department. The, the search involved every level of law enforcement in the United States. With Dorner's reputation for the unpredictable in mind, police proceeded with caution as they began their investigation. He was well armed. He had access to assault weapons, uh, and extremely high powered assault weapons at that. Uh, he had a uh, large quantity of ammunition. He was very mobile. With the normally tranquil ski resort now overrun with detectives, the search for Dorna began. We're at using uh, snow cats and APCs with chains on them to get to those areas. Deputies say they searched 200 homes in an eight mile wooded area where Christopher Dorner's burnt out truck was discovered. Knocking on doors, going through fields and forests, um, trying to see if they could locate him or find him. You're talking about thousands of cabins in isolated areas. And as many as they searched out there, he had the advantage, no question. You could easily find an unoccupied cabin and maybe break in and, and stay there. The challenges of tracking Dorna down in such hostile terrain would be considerable. Just the element of surprise that he actually had the benefit of. When you don't know where somebody is hiding, it gives them an extreme advantage. 
He didn't know if he was hiding behind a tree with a sniper's rifle. They were trudging around trying to uh, locate him, and he could be behind any tree or any corner waiting to shoot them and kill them. As the story began to break worldwide, observers started to examine what might be driving Dorner to commit his crimes. You, know, you have to sit there and, and really think hard, is this the guy that I knew or was the guy that I knew a facade? I mean, was he, you know, pulled one over on me all those years? To see somebody go from being a bright, capable young man with a bright future to America's most wanted, um, you know, mass murderer. I was flabbergasted. I think what Mr. Dorner ultimately realized was that in a sense his world was crumbling around him. Everything that he had tried to accomplish and set out as goals, whether it be in the military or in law enforcement, didn't end well for him. He was a failure and he couldn't deal with that. He couldn't accept that um, and he had nowhere else to go and ultimately uh, wrought retribution. In the years that followed his dismissal from the LAPD, Dorna would suffer further personal setbacks, resulting in a steady slide into depression. Being depressed, as Dorna suggested, is not the sole reason why individuals engage in spree killings. No doubt he was depressed. What Dorna had that was different to the millions of other people who become severely depressed is he had narcissistic tendencies, he had access to firearms, and he also had a willingness to kill to prove his point. With his life at its lowest ever ebb, Dorna began to ready himself for what he called his last resort. After he was dismissed from the police department, he was apparently buying and selling guns and suppressors and ammunition and the whole time stewing about what had happened to him. Following the killings in Irvine and Riverside, Dorna had fled to the mountains of Southern California. Search parties continued to scour Big Bear for any sign of the fugitive killer. However, their progress was slowed by hostile weather conditions. The SWAT team and more than 120 heavily armed officers have been combing the area for two days. The snow slowing but not stopping their search. Locals and authorities alike feared Christopher Dorner may have slipped the net. Other than his burned out vehicle, um, we had no specific information that he was still in the Big Bear area. The longer the time passed, more and more people were thinking that he was gone. However, such feelings would prove unfounded. The 12th of February, 2013, 12.22 p.m. Mountain Vista Resort, Big Bear. 911 received a call from holiday cabin owner, Karen Reynolds. 911 emergency, what are you reporting? You guys were tied up? He went into a cabin where a couple were arrived, I guess, after he had uh, broken into that cabin, and he held them, tied them up and held them captive. The victims are managed to free themselves. They call the authorities, and they report that he has taken their car. What's the make and model? It's a Nissan Rogue, R-O-G-U-E. Those people are very fortunate that they are still alive. With fresh information to hand, officers Jim Simons and Mike Medici now had a hot lead on a trail they feared had gone cold. Suspect left 15 to 30 ago and took keys to Nissan Rogue. Our mission was to find Dorner, was to find the car he was driving, was to try to outthink him where he was going next. Down the mountain. Christopher Dorner made it very clear that we law enforcement officers were his targets. So yeah, it obviously heightened our awareness. While officers Simons and Medici continued to pursue Dorner, unsuspecting local resident Rick Helterbrake 
would be confronted by the most wanted man in America. Right about in here, I see a crashed car, and then I see Dorner coming out of the snowbank right there, right at me. I remember him coming at me. I remember the vest. He had a big ballistics vest on with pockets in it. He's got a gun right at my head. I could tell it was some kind of assault rifle. I go like this, put my truck in park. He says, I don't want to hurt you. Just get out and start walking. I had that sense that I wasn't one of his targets. You know, he wanted to kill cops, and I wasn't a cop. I left the, the truck roughly in this position right here. I got up, and I started walking up the road. You realize you just got confronted by the most wanted man in America, and, um, you know, he let me go. After Rick alerted authorities to his encounter with Dorna. A white Dodge pickup truck headed down down Flash Road. The pursuit would hurtle towards its explosive end. All double units to Glass Road in 38. The terrain out there was wide open, nothing but trees and snow. Um, you talk about rubbernecking, we had to look in a, in a swivel for him because you didn't know what tree he was behind, what set of rocks he might be behind. We knew he was, uh, he was not going to go easy. We knew it was probably going to end up in some type of uh, confrontation involving gunfire. San Bernardino Sheriff's deputies Alex Collins and Jeremiah McKay also joined the chase. Jeremiah was very familiar uh, with the Big Bear area. He had been stationed up there um, as a deputy with the San Bernardino Sheriff's Department. So he was hot on Mr. Dorner's trail. Are we sure he's in the vehicle? And what tracks are we following, vehicle or foot? The radio traffic told us to go a, a direction which was a right turn for us. Um, Jeremiah went left, and we did make that right turn, according to the radio. We got to the intersection, and that's when we started hearing the gunfire. Shots fired, shots fired, Seven Oaks Cabin, Seven Oaks Cabin. Copy, shots fired, Seven Oaks Cabin. As shots began to ring out, deputies Collins and McKay found themselves in the line of fire. Returning fire. Copy, returning fire. Officer down, officer down. Copy, officer down. Alex Collins had taken a shot to the face and another three to his chest, arm and leg. Dorna's crosshairs would then fall on Jeremiah McKay. He turned around, we pulled up and saw Jeremiah on the ground. I saw that Jeremiah McKay was down and he wasn't moving. It, it appeared that he was he, he was dead. Christopher Dorner had claimed another life and had left another officer seriously wounded. Staging his last stand, Dorner barricaded himself into an uninhabited cabin, taking aim at anyone in his sights. Fire, automatic fire coming inbound. Mike Medici and Jim Simons would return fire. Dorner started shooting at the, the deputies pinned down behind their vehicle. Automatic fire inbound. So we immediately just started shooting at Christopher Dorner in the cabin trying to get him to stop firing. All you would hear are thuds, basically, coming over your head. There was no question in my mind he was not going to just give up or stop. SWAT is on scene. More teams of officers responded. Constant exchange of gunfire. I mean, hundreds and hundreds of rounds being shot back and forth. Deputies are still down in the kill zone. 
and he would start shooting at the, the deputies pinned behind the car again. We can hear the rounds, you know, hitting their car. They are popping off smoke to get the wounded deputies out. Under the cover of smoke, officers Collins and McKay were retrieved from the kill zone. Deputy Collins would receive treatment for his injuries. As the gun battle raged, officers moved in to pin down the man they had been hunting for. The San Bernardino SWAT team started making a tactical plan. 445, we need the armored vehicle. 445, copy, we need the armored vehicle. At 4.15 p.m., more than two hours into the cabin siege and nine days since the spree began, Dorna's last chance of escape was about to go up in smoke. In 2013, Christopher Dorner would embark on a killing spree, declaring his intent to dispatch vigilante justice against his former employers at the LAPD. He was a ghost. You never knew where he was or firing from. The out-of-control ex-cop would take the lives of four in nine days, leaving two other victims critically wounded. Sought by law enforcement authorities from across California, Dorna would stage his last stand in a remote mountain cabin near the tourist town of Big Bear. There was no question in my mind he was not going to just give up or stop. The officer down, officer down. Even with the cabin surrounded and the odds stacked against him, Dorna seemed determined to continue his fight until the last. They made announcements to come out and give yourself up um, numerous times. Periodically, the gunfire from inside the cabin continued. At that point, it was very obvious he had no intentions of giving up at all. Having refused all negotiations for over two hours, at 4.15 p.m., SWAT teams would execute a plan designed to smoke Dorna out deploying potent tear gas canisters, known as burners, into the cabin. Control 61 Lincoln, we're going to be deploying a gas burner. Ultimately, the Sheriff's Department end up throwing in a smoke canister, you know, which it kind of explodes and expels the gas with a flame. We have a fire. Unfortunately, that started a fire inside the cabin. The whole time, we, we never got any communication back from Christopher Dorner in any way. No intentions of turning himself in or giving himself up. OK, guys, be ready on the number four side. We have fire in the front. It might come out the back. Watching events unfold live on TV, Dorner's former friend, James Usera, felt mixed emotions. It was bizarre to sit there watching the TV screen. The cabin was on fire. One side fully engulfed, fire on the fort. That was the moment where I kind of knew that, okay, my friend's gonna die, and there's nothing, there's nothing anybody can do about it. He ain't coming out of that alive. Shortly after the cabin became engulfed by flames, a single sound emerged from the hut. It sounded like one shot fired from inside the residence that signaled the end of nine days that would rank as some of the most chaotic in California's recent history. Copy, one shot fired from inside the residence. We heard a single gunshot, which we believed was um, Christopher Dorner uh, committing suicide, taking his own life. Even in uh, death, you know, he denied reality. I think he took the cowardly way out. He was man enough to take the lives of several people, but he was not man enough to do the time for it. He chose the narcissist's way out by ending his own life. Making the final decision over life and death, he chose to control what happened to him, not the police. For detectives and citizens alike, the end of Dorna's spree 
offered a chance to reflect on the events of the previous nine days. The sense of relief was nobody else is going to die today. I was very relieved that we had finally put an end to this madness that he had created. He was an evil man. He came to an evil end, and uh, the world's better for it. As the smoke from the smoldering cabin began to clear, thoughts turned towards what could have been behind Dorna's decision to conduct his killing spree. Chris was a very capable young man. He, he could have done anything. I mean, he was smart, he was educated, so to see it end the way that it did, you know, we're all left asking questions about what, what was the catalyst, you know, what made him snap. Dorner was in his 30s at the time. This is a time in many men's lives when they feel they should be reaching the pinnacle of success. And instead, Dorner was sliding downhill fast. And it's that lack of success that made him believe that there was little hope for the future and he was going to get even through the barrel of a gun. He's taken on this anger and fury and personalized it. And at that point, he starts to lose sense of reality and focus more on this idea of gaining revenge. It's not something I ever would have expected, but, you, I mean, do you, can you honestly say that there's anybody you've ever met who you would expect would be a killer someday? I mean, you just nobody expects that of other people. Like many other grudge-based spree killers, Dorner is clearly laying the blame at the feet of his victims. He's prepared to murder a number of individuals and see it as being a justifiable crime. This forms part of his narcissistic personality. He's more keen on getting his version of events across than any remorse he may feel for the victims. Without the bravery displayed by officers in the line of duty, the ultimate outcome of Dorna's spree may have been far graver. Law enforcement is full of heroes. Um, the, the men and women of all of the agencies that participated in the manhunt for Dorna uh, acted as heroes. And every one of them faced danger every time they put on this uniform or one like it and went out into public. And they know it. What is beyond doubt is that the loss of innocent life suffered at Dorna's hand over those nine days was senseless. You know, Dorner never killed anybody that knew him or anybody that had any direct connection with all the things that, that he thought had been done wrong to him. Uh, all of his four victims were completely innocent. It's obviously an extreme shock to all the police officers when we do lose a, a, a colleague. I think it kind of brings us together closer. I think it increases our camaraderie um, because we realize that, you know, at any time one of us can be shot and killed. I went to Deputy McKay's uh, funeral service. I ran into uh, an old friend of mine that I hadn't seen for probably 15 or 20 years. And I was just talking with him at the funeral and then he told me that his daughter was Deputy McKay's wife. And at that moment, I started, he and I started crying. It's, it's a very tragic situation. In 2006, a postal building in California would come under attack. The one guy came in at nine and started yelling at somebody shooting. It was four of them rapid succession. Pop, 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 pop. The assailant almost unique amongst spree killers. That is extremely rare. Most women simply aren't that violent. Jennifer San Marco would dispatch her victims with cold, deadly efficiency. She didn't miss and shooting anybody. As the clock ticked, the body count rose. She literally walked up to them and shot them almost point blank. And with it, the question, why had this petite middle-aged woman embarked on her ruthless killing spree?
Santa Barbara County in California, one of the most desirable regions in the Golden State. Nestled between the city of Santa Barbara and the university campus of Isla Vista is the coastal community of Goleta. Goleta is a great town, a great place to live. It's nice. You know, they call Goleta, I guess, means the good land or whatever. There's a very strong environmental element to the community, uh, preserving open space, preserving uh, the beach, preserving wildlife. In the Goleta city limits, serious crimes against persons are a fairly rare occurrence. We only had one homicide in the last 14 years. But on one day in 2006, the peace in Goleta would be shattered in a way no one was expecting. January the 30th was a normal day here in the Bureau. It was a clear um, uh, day. It was unusually warm for that time of the year. For most of Goleta's population, including the Sheriff's Department, the daylight hours had been relatively uneventful. Made it through the entire shift. It was pretty much a, a routine. Uh, about 5 p.m., we, is the end of our day, went home, uh, did the stuff uh, that I normally do when I get home is uh, family dinner. Deputy Clay Turner was one of a small team of officers scheduled for the evening shift. Me and a couple of the other guys on, on the shift had earmarked a, a local uh, place in town that we were going to grab our meal at. We ordered our meals and we had just gotten our, our cups for, for us to fill ourselves with our drinks from the uh, fountain uh, when, when the, the call came out over the radio. The 30th of January, 2006, around 9 p.m., U.S. Postal Facility, Galita. 911 calls began coming in from workers at the mail processing plant. Sheriff's Department, how can I help you? Yeah, there's the first one that's shooting everybody. There's somebody shooting? Copy, five and round. This is the code three for a shooting at the post office. I knew it was the real deal, just by the tone of voice and what was going on. This has got to be righteous. This is not somebody dreaming this thing up. It's not, not firecrackers. My coworkers are yelling through, you know, oh my God, somebody, I call 911. Mm -hmm. You know, and then, you know, this uh, suspect starts shooting her. I can't imagine what the people in the restaurant were thinking, but we sprinted out the door and uh, got into our patrol cars and started heading towards the call. 911. Shots have been fired. Okay. We have one down for sure. One down? At least. Law enforcement rushed from all directions towards the large building where hundreds of staff were employed, aware that many lives were potentially in danger. I'm responding, but I'm literally, I'm talking on, with both cell phones to my ears. Like I'm talking to different people and steering with my knee. Um, I had to get down here as quickly as possible. How many people did you see get shot? Uh, I saw one and then, uh, you know, when I uh, took off, I, I, I saw her, uh, you know, shooting uh, somebody else. What was going through my head was if there was somebody that was on the loose inside that facility, knowing how big it was, my fear was the potential of finding many more uh, people that had been shot and either wounded or killed on the inside. Officers arriving were confronted by several employees fleeing for their lives. Everybody started, started coming out and they were, they all were primarily running. They were in absolute panic. They had lost it. There was no stopping them. They just wanted to get as far away on foot from that location as they could. And I, I mean, they're, they're like running. They basically came right, right down their main driveway. It appeared that someone had begun shooting in the staff car park and then entered the building. But little more was known. We didn't know if the shooter had left at that point or was still inside. We were sorting through the crowd to try and find somebody who, who would know something. We were getting broken information as to what the suspect might be wearing, blue jeans, red shirt, dark hair, maybe a male, maybe female. And this is all within a matter of seconds of us pulling up that we're trying to do all this. 
Who and where the shooter was were unknown, but one thing was clear. There were dead and dying postal workers at the scene. When the deputies arrived, they, the first thing they did is tend to the people that were down in the parking lot. We got into what they, they described as a diamond formation. Um, I believe all of us were armed with AR-15s in, in addition to our sidearms. Um, and uh, as, as we started transitioning down the sidewalk, the first victim I saw, she's looking right at me, but I knew she was gone. It's got two black tags, two red tags, and the place was still not secure. Copy, so far two black and two red. I was in the newsroom, um, and we monitor the police scanner, and we heard a shots fired call. And it was pretty clear very quickly that it was a, a large incident because there's certain phrases that they use uh, regarding whether or not there's a dead body or an injured person. They use red tag and black tag. In one of the aisles of the parking lot, I saw two more victims that were down. So uh, me and the other guys, we, we breached. We went into the building. Inside the door, the deputies discovered postal supervisor Charlotte Colton shot in the head, but still alive. Ahead of them, a corridor leading to the main warehouse. You're taught to go to the sounds, the shooting, find the suspects, stop the suspect. Well, there's no shooting. All that's coming forth is the constant machine sound. And you could hear the phone ringing and ringing and ringing. As news of the attack spread like wildfire among the postal workers, there were rumors about the identity of the killer, centering on an ex-employee. All the witnesses, well, at least many of them, all uh, had said that they recognized the shooter as being a former employee of the, of the facility named Jennifer San Marco. 44-year-old Jennifer San Marco had worked at the Postal Service for around six years before leaving the job two years before. When she first started there, she was fairly normal, about as normal as anybody else was. Uh, I talked to her on numerous occasions, because a lot of times when you're working side by side, you talk to people. And she was very, very intelligent. She was fairly quiet. She worked at a case where she would get a tray of letters, and you'd, you know, what you would call pigeonholes, but you'd put them in like this. She was really, actually fairly attractive. I mean, when she first started, I'm sure some of the guys thought she was, you know, she was a pretty good looking girl. She seemed, it was kind of both gregarious and a loner. She, you know, she was one of those people, you could, hey Jennifer, how you doing? She, oh, hey Robert, how are you? You know, from across the hour or something like that. And she was friendly, you could approach her, you could talk to her, but there was also, uh, a side door that was kind of a little bit standoffish. Now, eight years later, the quiet former employee appeared to have the blood of her colleagues on her hands and was somewhere inside the giant sorting room. In January 2006, former postal employee Jennifer San Marco was on the loose with a gun inside a giant sorting room in Goleta, California. Rushing to the scene, sheriff's officers followed a trail of bodies from the car park into the postal facility. In the entrance corridor, Deputy Clay Turner and his team discovered the seriously wounded postal supervisor, Charlotte Colton. My number one goal at that point in time was to get uh, the medical professionals in to, to cater to the two that were down in the parking lot, the one on the sidewalk, just in case maybe I was wrong and she was still alive and to deal with the, the still breathing Miss Colton. Clay confirmed that we had four people down. He wanted four ambulances and it was my plan to have four deputies to be basically the armed guard to go in with these rescue units of which I ended up being one of the rescue units because we were down in staffing. Although dreadfully wounded, Charlotte Colton appeared to be responding to the deputies that guarded her. It almost seemed to us like her, her breathing became more calm and relaxed when we talked with her. While Clay and his team provided cover, the rescue crews deployed. The paramedic was supposed to check for signs of life. 
if there was signs of life, no treatment, no nothing, just get that person, put them on the gurney and get the heck out of there. And we did that pretty darn quick. They were able to extract Miss Colton um, uh, pretty quickly and uh, transported her to the hospital. Four casualties have been found in the car park and the entrance corridor. How many more were inside was uncertain. With the vast facility ahead, it was decided to wait for SWAT teams before entering. They set up at the employee entrance door. Uh, at that point, they did not hear any shooting. Uh, so they determined it was not an active shooter, and now they, they pulled back and just contained the area. They essentially waited for the, for the cavalry to get there. But just who was Jennifer San Marco, the architect of this chaos and catastrophe? And why had this middle-aged woman embarked on her deadly rampage? 1961, the 6th of December. New York, on the US eastern side. Jennifer San Marco was born. She grew up in the borough of Brooklyn. We're between Avenue L and Avenue K on Notion Avenue in Brooklyn. And this is across the street from Huddy Junior High School. Jennifer sat next to me in a class. We had a lot of fun talking, laughing, and not paying attention to class. Schoolmate Thomas Hogue admits he had a crush on the friendly but quiet teen. I thought that she was a catch. The catch meow. To be honest with you, I thought she was attractive, she was nice. Jennifer um, was always smartly dressed, um, very easygoing, quiet, um, able to laugh at jokes. I, I was kind of a class clown, so uh, the people around us were always laughing, and she kind of joined in in the laughter, but not so much in the dialogue. There are a lot of gaps in her history. She grew up in Brooklyn. Um, she went to high school there. She graduated in the in 78 from Edward R. Murrow High School. Right here, we used to line these stairs and, and uh, hang around, talk. After school, we would all be, uh, we would all congregate on the corner over there and then pick the activity. We'd play punch ball, which is a rubber ball you hit it and then you run bases like baseball and f touch football and the st stick ball, stuff that's popular street games. There was never any mention of any family or where she came from or anything like that. It seemed like it was almost kind of something that she didn't want to talk about to me. She had a distant family member that lived here in this county. Um, and they were close at one time, uh, back when they were growing up. But after the parents uh, split up, then said that they, they grew distant over, over the time. She was an outsider, outside of that classroom experience that I had. I didn't hear her say a word, boo to anybody else other than that. Other than, you know, all I saw was passing in the hallway, and she was pretty much alone. San Marco would eventually head out west to the sunshine of Santa Barbara County where she would pass through jobs as a corrections officer, a police dispatcher, and a school catering assistant, before taking a position with the US Postal Service. There, she would develop a reputation as a fast worker in the unique conditions of the vast Goleta facility. The building, square footage-wise, is about the size of four and a half American football fields. A male sorting center is all these boxes and parcels and letters are all coming into the central location and then they're being parceled out. So there are these massive, loud machines. The machines that sort letters. And they sort it to where when the carrier picks up his mail in the morning, it's all in order for him when he goes to deliver the mail. It's supposed to be. But there's still letters that the machine can't read or they're too big or something. That People still throw mail by hand. We do that every night still. The automation is fairly loud. Some people wear hearing protection. There are some operations where we can wear headphones and listen to a radio or a Walkman. There were plenty of times where I would listen to a book on tape just to help the time go by quicker and stuff like that. Some people thought it was monotonous or whatever, but the postal work was, of all the work I've done in my life, that was the best work that I ever had. And it was a very educated, workforce because Santa Barbara is a nice place to live it's pretty expensive but the the good benefits and the steady work of the Postal Service 
had there were some brilliant people who worked there. The young Jennifer San Marco had studied at one of the East Coast's flagship colleges. Now she was a full-time worker on the postal facility's late shift. She used to come to work at nine o'clock. A couple times she wasn't real friendly, and other times she was, you know, it was kind of like night and day sometimes. It soon became clear to her co-workers that all was not well. At first she'd be talking to herself in the cases where we threw the mail in. The conversations with her imaginary friend were fine at first. It was like, you know, she'd be sitting there talking and talking and talking, and I'd say, hey, Jennifer, how you doing? And she'd turn and say, oh, hey, Robert, how are you? You know, and I'd say, yeah, I'm doing great. But as time kept going on, it kept getting more and more angry, her conversations with her imaginary friend. Jennifer's behavior was on a downward spiral and was becoming increasingly irrational. I spoke to her one time when she was coming in, and she actually started yelling at me, you know, and I didn't really talk to her after that. I remember her coming in sometimes with lipstick on, where instead of putting it on like most women do, she just like, just across like war paint. San Marco's home life also appeared to be unraveling. She lived in a couple of places in Santa Barbara. Um, you know, we, we talked to one landlord where she lived for about a year and a half, and you know, she remembers having dinner with her. She was she described her as being really smart and vivacious and beautiful, and she couldn't believe that she was single. And then later on, she bought a condominium. That's where things started getting a little weird. Jennifer, when she went off the deep end, would start chanting or singing Beatles songs out loud and out in the middle of a condo complex. She would get into really heated arguments with her neighbor over noise. San Marco shared a party wall with her neighbor, Beverly Graham. Beverly Graham had lived in Santa Barbara for a really long time. She was a really sweet uh, lady. She was a phone operator, I think, for the gas or electric company. She was a really pleasant woman. The loud music led to a call to the sheriff's office. The deputies went out for a noise complaint. The noise went down, and the deputies cleared the call and went on for the rest of their duties. But Jennifer San Marco would not forget the incident. And at work, she became increasingly odd. Got to the point where she wouldn't acknowledge anybody, talk to anybody, uh, whatever, just like ignore everybody. But she still did her work. After six years working at the postal facility, Things came to a head when she made a disturbing comment to longtime co worker Dexter Shannon. She said to Dexter Shannon something about a woman, a former employee that they knew mutually, who committed suicide. Um, and there was something in that that prompted Dexter to go to his supervisor and say, Hey, you know, I'm concerned about her. I wasn't working too far away, but you could hear some yelling and. So everybody's kind of looking to see what's going on. She wouldn't go into the office, and they had to call in some law enforcement. Suddenly, all hell breaks loose. Jennifer goes flying by with the, the cops in tow. It was kind of scary. It took two guys to, you know, actually holding their legs and their arms and get handcuffs on her. To, I mean, I mean they, they had no other choice. The deputies um, handcuffed her and waited um, for a representative from the mental health assessment team. And that team made the determination to um, uh, commit her for a 72 hour involuntary hold uh, per 5150 of the Welfare and Institutions Code. I figured I wouldn't ever see her again. We know that she was examined. We know that she ultimately that there was a psychologist that was examining her and that did make a diagnosis to her and that she refused treatment and part of the problem that she had was a failure to admit that she had a problem. San Marco clearly had a history of problems that would be the hallmark of a descent into some serious mental health problem. So she was clearly an individual who was suffering psychotic delusions and intrusive thoughts and her behavior was becoming more removed from reality. After her ejection from the Postal Service, 
San Marco was retired on health grounds. Little did her colleagues know that Jennifer San Marco would one day return with murder in mind. Over a six-year period working for the US Postal Service in Goleta, California, Jennifer San Marco's odd behavior had escalated to the point that she was forcibly removed from the building and retired on health grounds. It's thought she decided to head back towards her family in the east, but it seems fate had something else in store. She packs her pickup truck, she drives east um, on Route 66, her car essentially breaks down, and that's why she settled at Milan. Grants in Milan area is really small, just um, not a lot really to do in the area unless you go outside, you know, to sightsee. New Mexico, flatland, um, not a lot of, not a lot of grass and a lot of um, trees and shrubbery, and a lot of dirt, kind of desolate. We have the mountains around. Um, smaller towns like Milan are very remote. If you want to live somewhere where it's nice and quiet, it's a place to be. Selling her apartment in Galita, San Marco decided to buy a property in the desert town. Abel Ortega supplied the fuel for her home. She was real good looking. She had long hair and uh, she was really nice. And uh, we always, you know, we would take her gas and she'd come in the next day or whatever and pay for it. She lived uh, in an A-frame house right behind the office here. And uh, she had a 250 gallon tank and she was a very good customer. It was just your standard two-story single family home, um, standard backyard, but then as the land went out farther, it was kind of desolate and, and desert type. San Marco would be a regular visitor to the village administrator's offices, where she would become somewhat fixated with employee Sonia Salazar. For that first year, she came in, she would just pay her bill. She was pretty normal, just a normal customer. As she would go in, she would ask for me. Or if I wasn't there in the office where she could see me, she would be looking for me because my co-worker would say, she's, you know, she asked for you, and if I wasn't there, she would just look for me, and then um, they would help her the best they could, and then she would leave. But after around 12 months, Jennifer San Marco began to noticeably change. Probably after a year, she, she came in um, with a short, spiky haircut. It looked as though she had taken scissors to her hair. Uh, it was not a, a haircut. It was obviously something she had done to herself. Good morning, sir. Good morning. How are you today? Good morning. I can help you here. And uh, her dress was completely different. She looked like a different person. Um, she, but through that year, she wasn't as nice to me anymore. And if I wasn't there, she, um, you know, she wouldn't even let them help her. She would just leave. She'd go up to the cash register and she says, I came to pay my bill. And uh, so I'd look it up and, you know, and I say, well, you don't know nothing. And she'd look to her right and she'd say, see, I told you that I didn't owe a bill that I had already paid it. And, uh, and she'd have a little discussion there, you know, with her imaginary friend. And then, uh, and then she'd look like that and she said, okay, well, thank you very much, she says, and then she'd leave, you know. She would go to grocery stores and she would buy stuff and that she would just, when she would leave, she'd go out and throw it in the trash, including the money. And that was, and the same, she would buy liquor, at other stores and just throw it in the trash. San Marco entered the village offices, wishing to apply to publish a series of documents she'd written. I was sitting at my desk and she sat across from me and that's when, you know, I, I noticed that um, there was something wrong. She was arguing um, and using foul language, but not towards me. Um, so she would ask me a question, and as I was answering her question, uh, she was then arguing with someone that was not there, in other words. 
Jennifer had wanted to apply for a business license, which was actually um, a business uh, that she would name the Racist Press. The title of the publications struck a chord with her former Brooklyn schoolmate, Thomas Hogue. So this was largely a, an Italian neighborhood um, at the time, totally changed now. But in the 70s, this is largely Italian, and uh, most of the people that were hanging out with were, were Italian. They started the phenomenon of busing, where young children of color were brought from other neighborhoods into our neighborhood. The thought was to alleviate crowding in the, uh, in the slums, so to speak. And that caused a little racial strife. So a little bit of, it was a kind of turbulent a little bit. There was some free flowing use of the N-word and uh, it was a new thing for people in the neighborhoods to experience. So it was a bit uncomfortable. The only thing that I saw that was of uh, to interest to note is that she was part of that whole crew where people were threatened in the neighborhoods by change and the, uh, the busing in of people from different neighborhoods, different color. But despite its inflammatory title, San Marco's racist press was far from a bigoted tirade. I pledged my life to defend the premise of democracy in this country and could not in good conscience pay for or justify a politically motivated racist murder, not one or a thousand. There were five volumes of the racist press. In reading them, I was expecting to see something more overt. I thought that she would come out and start making disparaging remarks against anybody of color um, or any type of religious backgrounds. And a lot of it was just hard to understand. The documents alluded to an elaborate conspiracy theory. The United States government functions as a white supremacist affiliate embracing Nazi German dogma. She thought that the government uh, was somehow controlling people in coots with the KKK, she made a link to the Rocky Horror Picture Show, and that all of those things were sending messages to people to commit murders. A government conspiracy, psychics, and the Rocky Horror Picture Show? It sounds absurd for a sophisticated nation using this format as a legitimate, plausible strategy. As 2005 continued, San Marco's neighbors in New Mexico noticed her going downhill rapidly. I did know of the, uh, the time that she had stripped at a local gas station. Right back here um, at the edge of the building over here, she would uh, get on her knees and uh, start like praying, you know, and she'd be, you know, with her hands up like this and that and start praying and, uh, you know, found it kind of weird. We clearly know that when individuals have got severe mental health problems, having a significant other there to share your worries, to get advice from, to talk about your symptoms, is clearly much more beneficial than individuals who are on their own. We see individuals who are isolated go down this descent spiral very quickly. However, there may have been another element playing on San Marco's mind. July 1976, New York City. Serial killer, the son of Sam, begins a campaign of violence on the streets of the metropolis. In the past year, a psychopathic gunman has killed six people and wounded eight others in New York City. He calls himself the son of Sam. You know, she grew up there. She was aware of this. She mentions it in her writing. Over a 12-month period, postal worker David Berkowitz had preyed on young New Yorkers, shooting them with a handgun and spreading panic throughout the city. You had this guy going around randomly killing people and they had no idea what this was about. And I think if you were a young person, a teenager, particularly a girl, it would have been terrorizing. And it appeared San Marco, a petite young woman of Italian descent with long dark hair, fitted exactly what New Yorkers believed to be the son of Sam's preferred target. 
people were very nervous, apprehensive. Girls cut their hair, changed the color. Streets were empty. Everybody uh, was just terrified. Had no idea where he was going to pop up next. For journalist Scott, there are too many parallels in the two tales to ignore. David Berkowitz was a postal employee who believed that a dog was giving him a messages to kill people. Jennifer San Marco was a postal employee. She apparently talked to animals. She thought birds were giving her messages. The notorious 70s killer also featured in San Marco's writings. Fact. The post office employed David Berkowitz in the 1970s during his infamous reign of terror as what the media dubbed the Son of Sam Killings. Was David Berkowitz a psychotic or psychic killer? The Son of Sam would go on to shoot six victims dead and injure more before being captured in 1977 when Jennifer San Marco was 16. 28 years later, in 2005, San Marco would take the parallels one stage further when she bought a handgun of her own. The semi-automatic handgun that she had, um, she purchased from pawn shop in New Mexico and um, waited a 15 day uh, waiting period uh, and went and picked it up. And at that point also bought 200 rounds of, uh, of, of reloaded nine millimeter uh, ammunition. Both these actions, again, are perfectly rational and cogent. So she clearly had periods where she was able to be in touch with reality and certainly knew what she was planning on doing far in advance. In the backyard, there was a lot of uh, some target practice. Like, you can tell that she or somebody had been out there um, shooting a gun, practicing on uh, shooting targets. Not knowing how far and how, how far she was from the target, you could tell that whoever was shooting was, was a good shot. And San Marco was about to use her skills to deadly effect. In 2003, after displaying bizarre behavior, postal worker Jennifer San Marco had been forcibly removed from the Galita sorting facility where she worked and retired on health grounds. She had resettled in New Mexico, where her behavior had become increasingly strange. Now the 44-year-old was about to bring vengeance down upon her former workplace. At the end of January 2006, Jennifer San Marco got in her truck and headed back to California. Sometime just before the start of the 9 p.m. shift change, Jennifer San Marco arrived at the Galita Postal Facility. She drove all the way here from New Mexico on one, one trip. Knew when shift change was going to be. Timed her arrival at the gate. In order to get through the first security system, San Marco tailgated another vehicle and entered the staff car park. She parked her truck. Uh, backed into the stall uh, about 100 feet from the employee entrance door. But still, you need a badge to get in the front door. San Marco held up an employee at gunpoint and demanded he hand over his pass, which would provide electronic access to the secure staff entrance. And then she told him, OK, now get out of here. And of course, he, he took off. Although she had spared one employee, it wouldn't last. In the car park, San Marco encountered 37-year-old Z Fairchild and shot her in the head. She didn't miss. It's pretty steely on her part to be able to do that. San Marco was seen approaching the staff entrance before turning towards 28-year-old Malika Higgins and shooting her. She literally walked up to them and shot them almost point blank. Just outside the employee entrance, San Marco encountered and shot 42-year-old Nicola Grant. 
when the shooting was occurring out in the parking lot, there was, a, there was a couple employees that were in a break room, which was adjacent to the parking lot. And they heard what sounded like, like gunfire. And they looked out the window. They didn't see her shooting anybody at that point. But she said that she looked at them and smiled. Jennifer San Marco then entered the building where around 80 people were working. It was somewhere near 9 o'clock when I heard the first loud report, and it was very loud. When you have as much automation as we have running and the other machines and that going on, it's very loud in there. But this thing was loud. I had heard some noises, and I thought, we have these things that sometimes a male comes in on, they're called uh, a pallet. If you stand them up straight up and then you let it fall, when it hits the ground, it makes a very loud report. So a lot of us thought it was just a, a pallet dropping. So I expected when I looked up, one of my mail handling friends would be there saying, boy, you're really getting into your work or something like that. What I saw was one of my coworkers grab a female employee, throw her to the side, point to the door and yell, run. The one guy came in at nine and started yelling that somebody's shooting. You kind of think, oh, yeah. Despite workers' disbelief, the situation was very real. San Marco had made her way deeper into the complex. There she would shoot 44-year-old supervisor Charlotte Colton. She was a beautiful woman physically, but the, that beauty went way more, you know, it wasn't just skin deep or whatever. She was, uh, she was a bright light in, in this town that was snuffed out. One of Charlotte's colleagues dragged her into the entrance corridor, where Deputy Clay Turner later discovered her. But Jennifer San Marco was not finished. The first shot, there was a pause of about three or four seconds. Then I heard two more shots, pop, pop. She made her way towards her old workstation. 52-year-old Lupe Schwartz must have seen San Marco coming, but she couldn't save herself and there was a pause of about one or two more seconds and there was four of them rapid succession. Pop, 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 pop! And that was when I caught some movement in the peripheral vision to my left side and I heard somebody yell, go, go, go. Grandfather Dexter Shannon was wearing headphones. He never heard San Marco coming and was shot dead at point blank range. Dexter had a bunch of kids and grandkids, but he had served in the Air Force and had been in Vietnam himself. Oh, he was a very nice man. I never heard Dexter say an unkind word about anyone. After shooting six of her former co-workers, Jennifer San Marco used her handgun to take her own life. She was laying on the floor in a prone position and she still clutched the weapon in her hand. So we had to pry her fingers away from the trigger and, and away, away from the grip of the gun to get it out of her hand. It was still loaded and cocked and ready to be fired. Most spree killers want to commit suicide. They, they believe that this life is not worth living. They're so miserable and they don't see a way out. But first, they want to get even with everyone responsible for those miseries. So they, that's why they engage in a killing spree first, and uh, many of them are suicidal. For all those involved, the enormity of what had happened began to sink in. Like it wasn't even real, you know, until I saw somebody who was actually, you know, laying dead on the sidewalk. That I, I knew that it was real. Four had died at the scene. Two, including Charlotte Colton, who deputies had desperately tried to comfort, died in hospital. The deputies were reassuring her and talking to her the entire time. I just wish we could have gotten there sooner. You know, because all of us want to prevent destruction and prevent um, anyone having to feel that kind of pain 
of losing uh, a loved one. But this shocking tale was not yet over. I had just arrived home and I just, I was laying down and when my phone went off again and it was my lieutenant telling me that we had another homicide. The victim was San Marco's former neighbor, Beverly Graham, who hadn't been seen since the previous day. Hi, uh, my girlfriend's dead. Please send somebody right away. We had a homicide reported and we staged in this area, getting ready to make entry into the apartment. Miss Graham's uh, boyfriend was the one who discovered the, the, uh, the decedent, Miss Graham. It became clear that before Jennifer San Marco had made her assault on the postal facility, she had decided to settle a score with the neighbor who had complained about her loud music. The wall you see is uh, the area where San Marco had access to the rear of, of, of the apartment. There was hair pulled from somebody's head that was scattered across the coffee table and around the apartment, and uh, there were things that were kind of in disarray. Jennifer San Marco's deadly spree had cost the lives of seven innocent people. But the question remained, why? For San Marco, a woman whose life had been disintegrating slowly around her, I think this was her last roll of the dice. I think the realization that she'd hit rock bottom was perhaps the trigger point that then allowed her to listen to her paranoid beliefs and conspiracy theories. Most women simply aren't that violent. Her killing spree uh, must have come from a profound belief that her job meant a tremendous amount to her. There was nothing any of these people did. I mean, even when you look through these weird slights that she was documenting, there was nothing any of these people did that um, caused them to be targeted in some way. Whatever her perceived motivations, Jennifer San Marco's ruthless killing spree had devastated countless lives and changed a community forever. Every time I come to this intersection, uh, very rarely do I not think about that night. In the days and weeks that unfolded, we got to see and hear more about the victims and their families and... Oh, this by far was the the dark part of my career. <laughs> there isn't a day that's gone by that I haven't thought about what happened that night or who we lost or the friendships that we shared or anything. Yeah, I, I think about it quite often when I walk in on the front door. You know, it was... Uh, it was a pretty big deal. In 2011, 22-year-old Jared Loeffler would embark on a swift and brutal rampage that would make world headlines. Congresswoman Gabrielle Giffords was among those shot. Men. All of a sudden, I heard a bang. Women. There was multiple people shot. And children. Oh, my God would die at his hand. As the seconds ticked, the body count rose. It was just an eerie scene of people dead, taking their last breaths. And with it, the question, what had driven this youth from the Arizona suburbs to commit his deadly killing spree? This is my genocide school. <laughs> <laughs> January 2011, Tucson, Arizona. A thriving city set amidst an arid landscape in the southwestern corner of the United States. 
In a downtown shopping mall, recently re-elected Senator Gabrielle Giffords was about to begin a session of Congress on Your Corner, an opportunity for a meet and greet with the local residents. Gabby is my congresswoman, and um, she liked to make herself available to her constituents. People didn't have to come to her office. She would announce where she was going to be and invite people to come and talk with her. Many had been looking forward to the morning, and with an air of anticipation, a crowd gathered for the 10 a.m. start. It was a beautiful, crisp, clear, bright blue sky Saturday morning. And we went out to uh, the Safeway just to pick up a couple of small items. I pulled into the parking lot and I could see the big sign up there that said Gabby Giffords. Everybody seemed to be pleasant, enjoying talking to each other. I was enjoying eavesdropping. Spirits were high, but unknown to those gathered, a danger lurked amongst them. There were 12 chairs sitting in front with 12 people, mostly couples, sitting in those chairs. So I walked to the end of the 12 chairs. But just moments in, and the lives of those waiting in line were suddenly torn apart. Within seconds of us walking into the store, that the pop started. I was standing there talking to this couple, and all of a sudden I heard a bang. And then a series of pop, 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 pop. Bang, 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 just like that. People started running into the Safeway, bloodied, screaming. They've shot the Congresswoman, they've shot the Congresswoman. I could see the shadow of the gunman walking down the sidewalk. And at point blank range, he was shooting everybody in the head. Pop, 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 pop. And when I dropped to the sidewalk, I felt the bullet hit the back of my head. 911, where's your emergency? Oh, 911, there was shooting that state where uh, Gabriel Gifford was. Was somebody shot them, sir? Yes, the guy who looked like the guy had a semi-automatic pistol. And he went in, he just started firing. And was, um, is anybody injured? Did you say Gabrielle Gifford was hit? Um, she's hit. Okay. He's breathing. Okay, and there's other people that are injured? Other people. There's multiple people shot. Okay. Oh, my God. 20584. The call came out, and we heard the audible tones saying that there was a serious incident that was going on. And what I was told next was there was a shooting at the Safeway. The car is reporting a shooting him out with a semi-automatic weapon. He shot at people, and he was last seen headed towards the Walgreens. He ran northbound out of the store wearing a black hoodie and blue jeans. And uh, we have a caller who believes that Gabrielle Giffords was shot at uh, multiple victims. There was lights and sirens the entire way. In just 17 seconds, the shopping mall had been transformed into a scene of bloody carnage. I couldn't accept, even then, even as I'm walking out, that there was actually somebody out there shooting. In the immediate aftermath, the ruthless spree became a global news story. We continue our team coverage on the mass shooting at a north side Safeway. Congresswoman Gabrielle Giffords was among those shot. The gunman had injured 13 people and brutally murdered six. Oh my God, there are dead people outside that door, right in your grocery store. And the world waited to hear who was responsible for the unprecedented and ferocious rampage. We will have some more information on the person in custody connected to these shootings. The Associated Press has identified the person, the suspected shooter, as 22-year-old Jared Loeffner. But what had driven the young man from a peaceful Tucson suburb to turn his gun on his fellow residents and commit such a frenzied killing spree? Ten ten a.m., Saturday the 8th of January, 2011. Tucson, Arizona has just been rocked by the actions of one young man, 
22-year-old Jared Lee Loeffner. All of a sudden, I heard a bang. They've shot the congresswoman. They've shot the congresswoman. In a killing spree lasting just 17 seconds, Loeffner had managed to end the lives of six people and wounded 13 more, including the critical shooting of Gabrielle Giffords. The congresswoman appeared to have been his main target. Known to be one of the oldest cities in the United States, Tucson, Arizona is located just 60 miles from the Mexico border. The culture is very influenced by the Mexican population. So we have a lot of uh, the Hispanic culture here. You'll have a lot of great Mexican food. Um, you'll see a lot of the Spanish dancing and in the music. It's beautiful, it's sunny. People have no idea when they hear about Tucson, Arizona, and think that it's just a big desert wasteland, and they come here and see the beautiful mountains and our fabulous weather. Despite its recent growth, the city is still renowned as a friendly, welcoming place. And we have a very small town feel, even though there's probably about 800,000 people that live in the community. Definitely just a nice, chill place. Um, great place to raise a family. You know, I love that growing up just because I, you know, I felt safe. One young resident's early years in Tucson began no differently to anyone else. Born on the 10th of September, 1988, Jared Lee Loeffner was raised an only child in a working class area of the city. His mother was a respected and well-liked manager for the Parks and Recreation Department of Pima County, and his father stayed at home, restoring cars for money. Growing up in Tucson, it's nice just because it's, uh, it's very quiet. You, know, you get to the suburbs and it's just a nice, calm place. Um, people, they're still friendly though. There's always something to do. There's never a boring time. During his early years, Loeffner enjoyed a close-knit circle of friends. I met Jared uh, through a mutual friend. We were in middle school, we were about like 12, 13 at the time, and uh, the common bond we had was music. You know, at that time, I had just learned how to play the guitar, so I was just like, I need to start a band, I need to go do something, and uh, a mutual friend was just like, hey, yeah, Jared, he plays bass, like, go, go talk to Jared. The, the first time I met Jared, um, I believe it was at a party, and because um, we kind of all had the same friends. Although he demonstrated a rebellious streak in his early teenage years, Loeffner was far from a concern to either his parents or those around him. I think we were with Jared. Um, we were in my neighborhood and we're going up and down the streets and we're, we're getting out and smashing all the mailboxes on the street. Pretty much just get into a lot of trouble. Drink, go, you know, wreak havoc on neighborhoods, kind of stuff like that. Despite some episodes of delinquency, his friends didn't consider him unusual amongst his peers. He was on the same page as everyone else. You know, his conversations, everything he was doing seemed absolutely normal. But as Jared Loeffner reached his late teens, the friendly, relaxed musician that everyone liked began to change for the worse. It seems that a big, big turning point in his life was he had a crush on a classmate in high school. According to the gal, he had a much, much bigger crush on her than she ever had on him. So she just gave him the door, you know, they broke up. And according to his uh, high school male peers, that was when the guy just really kind of began to lose it. I think he just really wanted to have friends and a girlfriend and stuff like that. And I think that that never worked out for him. So I think he felt kind of alone. He started uh, acting out in a way that, in retrospect, looks like the early uh, part of an onset of mental illness. He withdrew from school. He withdrew from friends. As an increasingly isolated teenager, Lofner eventually dropped out of high school in 2006. His slow retreat into a private world went relatively unnoticed. But five years later, he would grab the nation's attention with a vengeance. 
29 minutes past midnight, the 8th of January, 2011, Motel 6, Tucson. Ten hours before embarking on his killing spree, Jared Lofner checked into room 411. Throughout the night, Lofner carried out a series of movements that saw him putting into place the final preparations for an assassination attempt on Congresswoman Gabrielle Giffords. Before the spree, Lofner was clearly very busy. He was no doubt suffering from what we would often call future foreshortening. He wasn't looking much beyond the next 24 hours. In fact, he may not have believed he would survive the next 24 hours. As the night progressed, Lofner made several short trips to a local convenience store. At 1 a.m., he picked up a roll of newly developed film containing photos he'd taken of himself only hours earlier. There were several pictures of, of Jared Lofner, uh, one of him in female underwear. It was kind of odd. And, and there was a photograph of a 9mm gun on top of a, uh, a, a US textbook. Lofner made the final return to his room at 4.12 a.m. with his newly developed photographs. He logged on and entered into his familiar subversive world within the internet and began posting the bizarre images online. He spent into the wee hours on the computer, uh, sending emails out and, uh, you know, goodbye, dear friends, you know, stuff like that. Retreating into the online world was nothing new. In recent months, Lofner had been pushing away friends and family in the real world in favor of a community online where he hoped his increasingly irrational views would find a home. A lot of his MySpace records showed that he was into revolutionary literature such as Fahrenheit 351 as well as Mein Kampf. So he, he was well read in a, in a typical standard teenage way. One particular site was a gathering place for conspiracy theorists and skeptics, and here Lofner hoped his odd views would find recognition. He would often post long rambling comments, often about currency, about the constitution of America, how high schools were an illegal act, and how gold and silver were the only true currency to believe in. Lofner's views began falling on deaf ears, some onliners even going so far as to suggest he seek psychological help. A lot of his fellow students and professors became really spooked, very freaked out by the guy's very, very bizarre behavior. He seemed kind of irrational, very irritated, almost demanding certain things, just, just not calm anymore, almost, you know, just the total opposite. He was changed big time. He had a very, very bizarre temper. And I think he was starting to do drugs with uh, the guys who's hanging out with at that time. He didn't really seem, you know, always to be like happy-go-lucky or anything. He seemed like he kind of had like a, a dark side to him or maybe a sadness. While he was at Pima Community College, there were a couple of instances when issues as, um, as difficult to talk about as abortion or war would come up. And at the most unideal times, he would blurt out in laughter. One of his female classmates was talking about her very, very uh, traumatic experience uh, having an abortion. And Lana came up with this uh, remark like, Oh my God, you're a baby killer. And of course, people in the classroom would, would take exception to that and then would ask him what his problem was. What are you doing? Are you trying to make a mockery of what we're saying? And he would just always respond in kind by laughing and just saying, you're all idiots, you're all illiterate. You don't know anything that's going on here. Uh, some of the students were very, very spooked by his behavior. In fact, uh, one of the gals who was in her 50s and she had been a mental health technician, she took a seat by the door and she emailed one of her friends saying, you know, I just have a strong guts feeling that someday this guy's going to come into class with a gun and start shooting. And I just want you to know I'll be the first one out the door. 
We're examining the torture of students. The final straw for college authorities came when Lofner posted a disturbing video online. This is my genocide school, <laughs> where I'm going to be homeless because of the school. The Pima Community College police discovered a video he had made. He took a, a handheld camera and he walked around the campus of Pima Community College and he basically talked about it being the biggest waste of money in American education. This is Pima Community College, one of the biggest scams in America. We're like, this is from Jared? Like, what? Like, this, this is creepy. It's just, it did not seem like anything. It didn't seem like any of his interests that he was previously aligned with. Here's the best part, the bookstore. The bookstore, the bookstore, the bookstore. It is so illegal to sell this book under the Constitution. We are also censored by our freedom of speech. It was a rambling, psychotic video that uh, set off alarm bells in uh, the Pima Community College uh, Police Department. If the student is unable to locate the external universe, then the student is unable to locate the internal universe. Where is all my subjects? I could say something sound right now, but I don't feel like it. Finally, the authorities at Pima College had a meeting with uh, Lauder and his parents and said, you know, enough is enough. Uh, we're kicking you out of college. <laughs> they gave him a letter. They said um, that he was suspended from school and that he could not come back until he had a mental health evaluation and, and an, uh, an okay from a mental health professional, a psychologist or a psychiatrist. He was never able to produce that letter, of course. Thank you. This is Jared from Pima College. 7.04 a.m., the 8th of January, 2011. Just three hours before Lofner embarked on his killing spree, he again left his motel room and made yet another trip to a store. This time he tried to buy ammunition for a recently purchased handgun. He had attempted to purchase 9mm ammunition. However, his behavior was so erratic that the sales clerk denied him. Um, actually told him, I'll, I'll go check the back to see if I can find any extra ammunition. The clerk was, hey, something, something wrong with this guy. Came back and lied to, to Jared Lofner, telling him he had no ammunition to sell. The gun Lofner was trying to buy ammunition for was a high-capacity semi-automatic, legally purchased by himself only a few weeks earlier. He also developed uh, an interest in firearms, which isn't that unusual, but did concern some of his friends when uh, he showed up with a gun here or there. Some friends had some concerns about him owning a gun. At 7.31 a.m., undeterred, Lofner again attempted to purchase ammunition from a different store. This time, failing to raise any suspicions, he succeeded in buying eight boxes, containing a total of 400 rounds. He already had uh, his weaponry. He had the uh, Glock uh, semi-automatic uh, with several, several magazines, which nobody needs you know, unless you're in military combat. With only hours to go before the arrival of his main target, Congresswoman Gabrielle Giffords, Lofner was on the move once again. This time he was making his way home. As Lofner approached the front door of his house, he was confronted by his father. His father said, what the hell are you doing here with this uh, big uh, bag there? Where are you going? In recent months, the relationship between Lofner and his parents had become increasingly strained. His parents had actually disabled his vehicle and at one point taken away his shotgun uh, just because they feared that Jared might be doing something or might consider doing something uh, that wouldn't be safe for him or, or, or anyone else. Both Randy and Amy Lofner were clearly concerned about their son's behavior. Uh, they s tried to talk to him, and they just couldn't make any headway. 
But that, too, speaks volumes. It's, it speaks to his parents being concerned just about Jared's state of mind. They had no idea what he was about to embark upon, but they knew that their son was, uh, was battling something. And he was, he was certainly confused, to say the very least. Outside the front of the home, a standoff between father and son continued. But his dad was evidently very spooked to the point where he prohibited him to go back and use the car. Grabbing a black bag from the boot of the car, Lofner turned and fled from his home. The guy ran several blocks away, calls for a cab on his cell, so a cab comes down to pick him up. In just a matter of minutes, Lofner would embark on a killing spree that would shock the nation to its core. At around 10.10 a.m. on Saturday, the 8th of January, 2011, one of America's oldest cities was devastated by a brutal killing spree carried out by 22-year-old Jared Lee Lofner. Just one hour earlier, Tucson, Arizona, and the sun-drenched morning appeared to be as any other for the local residents. It was a beautiful Saturday morning, early January. It's a time, time of year that people who live in southern Arizona cherish because it's usually 70 degrees or so. It's sunny. Uh, it's a beautiful day to be outside. It was an absolutely normal day for me. It was a relaxed Saturday. I didn't have to work. I was going to do some grocery shopping, go visit my mother. Sunny, warm, uh, just a glorious day. And my husband and I went out on a walk. I had woken up fairly early that day, was just, you know, cleaning, doing various things, and I had gone to the gym. January 8th uh, was a day off for me. It was a Saturday. And I was at home with my family and enjoying the time that I had to be with my wife and my daughters. For these residents, their lives were about to become unintentionally entwined with the arrival of Senator Gabrielle Giffords. What was supposed to be happening at the Safeway that day was what's called a Congress on Your Corner. And it's a program that uh, Congresswoman Giffords had installed in which she would meet on occasion with her constituents. There were telephone calls made out to the constituents uh, the previous day informing them of the, of the event. And it was just an opportunity for her to interact with, with the people of Tucson and get a, a feel for what uh, some of the items or, or some of the political issues they had on their mind. I got a robocall from Gabby Giffords saying that she was going to have a Congress on Your Corner event Saturday, January 8th. And I went to thank her for her hard work that she does for us. Unbeknownst to Gabrielle Giffords and her team, what was supposed to be a very low-key, relaxed gathering had in fact a very real and present threat attached. Jared Lee Lofner had a burning hatred for the Congresswoman that could be traced back to an incident years previously. Lofner had actually met Gabrielle Giffords at a rally similar to the one where he committed his spree. He had actually been to a prior talk that our congresswoman gave, and uh, he raised his hand, he had a question. And he basically asked, quote, what is government if words don't have meaning? Congressman Giffords obviously didn't really know how to answer that question because it's, it's sort of without any context, how would you answer that? This was something he used to always say, words have no meaning. And she was kind of like, you know, nonplussed by that, said, well, Thank you, and let's move on to the next question. He took that slight very personally, and it's something that grew in him uh, over the months and, and years that followed. And it, it became not only a curiosity, uh, but it, it became a, a very directed hatred toward Congresswoman Gabby Giffords. A later exchange would compound the hatred he felt towards her. He also wrote to her office, and her office wrote back to him, but they made the mistake of addressing the letter to a Mr. Lofney rather than Lofner, and this angered him and proved that he was clearly intellectually superior to the people who were in power. So he had no respect for politicians, state, teachers, or authority. 
this kind of killing spree is not political. It comes out of psychopathology, not politics. And Jared Loeffner would have opened fire under these circumstances, even if he had never met Congressman Giffords. At 9.54 a.m., Loeffner arrived by taxi outside the Safeway store. Lots of small behavioural clues from Loeffner's behaviour before the spree show that he was completely lucid and coherent. He took a taxi to the supermarket where Giffords was speaking. He had the money on him to pay. He gave a bill to the taxi driver and insisted on the change, so he clearly knew what he was doing and where he was. Just yards away, Loeffner's intended target was about to greet those who had been queuing to meet her. When I went down there that day, I pulled into the parking lot and I could see the big sign up there that said Gabby Giffords. And so I parked the car and walked up there. Now there was probably 25 people in line. There was a number of elderly women and men, appeared to be couples, some not. There was a woman just slightly older than me with a little girl with her. And when I got about six feet from Gabby, one of her aides, Gabe Zimmerman, who I'd never met before, came out and talked to me and told me I'd have to get to the end of the line and sign in. Gabrielle Giffords is there just about ready to start her Congress on the corner. And I turned to my husband and I said, you know, you're lucky that I'm not more political or I would make you stop right now while I shake her hand. And he's like, come on, let's get inside and get, get the Brussels sprouts and the milk and get out of here before it gets too crowded. So we are walking in. The shooter is walking out at the exact same time. All of a sudden, this uh, crazed guy comes charging, barging his way through this line, way, way up to the front, takes out this uh, pistol and bang! He opened fire, shooting Gabrielle Giffords directly in the head. Gabe Zimmerman, who was one of uh, Gabrielle Giffords' leading aides, he immediately ran up to her aide, and he took a bullet in his head, which immediately killed him. Within seconds of us walking into the store, that the pop started. I knew immediately it was a gun. I was standing there talking to this couple, and all of a sudden, I heard a bang. I had no idea what that was. I'd never heard a gun fire before. And it wasn't until people started running into the Safeway, screaming, they've shot the Congresswoman, they've shot the Congresswoman, that my brain woke up and went, oh my gosh. I saw him just as a figure walking, as a, as a shadow. Turning to his left, facing the queuing line of now shocked attendees, he rapidly opened fire again. He pulled the gun up and he aimed it right at my head, and then he brought this hand up to grab the gun. If I ran to the north or ran to the west, I might make myself a target. So I laid down on the sidewalk, hoping that he would not notice me. When he brought this hand up to grab the gun, I dropped to the sidewalk. And when I dropped to the sidewalk, I felt the bullet hit the back of my head. And I went right on down and laid on the sidewalk. As the frenzied attack continued, Loeffner turned his gun on the then district director, Ron Barber. Another attendee, Judge John Roll, leapt in between the two in a moment of sheer bravery. Uh, John Roll pushed him under the table, jumped on top of him, and took a fatal, fatal wound in the back. I walked out, and the first body that I came to was Judge John Roll. I couldn't tell where he was shot, and I kept asking. There were a few people crawling around. Where is he shot? Where is he shot? I just started doing CPR. It was futile. I, I mean, he was just gone. He saved Ron Barber's life, but uh, lost his. After emptying his first magazine, 
Lofner attempted to reload his gun to continue his spree. In the seconds that followed, a bystander seized the opportunity and picked up the nearest chair, hitting Lofner across the back. And when this person tried to hit him with a folding chair, his left arm flew out, and that gave me a chance to grab his wrist. And I grabbed his left wrist just like this <clears throat> and stuck my foot in front of his feet and hit him just as hard as I could with my right hand. During the struggle that followed, Lofner fell to the ground. I hear, get the gun, get the magazine, and I knelt up. And as I knelt up, I'm right at the small of the back of the shooter. I took my hand and I grabbed it that I, I had his left wrist with, and I slid it right up to his throat like that. Lofner again attempted to grab another fully loaded magazine out of his back pocket. And in his haste, he dropped the magazine, and I was able to grab it before he could pick it up. And I told him if he moved, I'd choke him. And he went to roll a little, and I choked him. And he went, ow, 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 ow. In the heat of the moment, with Lofner subdued, one of the victims grabbed his gun. Another man actually took Lofner's gun and pointed it at him and uh, threatened to shoot him. And Bill Badger said, put the gun down and step on it right now. Put it on the ground and step on it. And, and so he did. With Lofner unable to escape, police raced to the scene. As I was heading there, the dispatchers were giving us more information. When the initial call came out and I heard those audible tones, there were the only information I was given was that there was a shooting, and as I was responding was when the updated information was given. Customers have tackled the suspect. They are holding him down at the Safeway. With the gunman restrained, he was soon in police custody, and news of his identity began to filter out. One of my close girlfriends, she calls me, and I, you know, I answer, and at this time, I'm like, well, where are you, what's going on? She's like, I'm at Safeway. And I'm like, okay, well, you know, are you all right? She's like, I don't know what happened. Um, she's like, but it was weird. She's like, I saw this young kid, and he looked familiar, and he had a gun, just point blank shooting people. I remember getting out of the gym, and my phone, I had like, 20 missed calls, all these different, you know, text messages. Have you heard? Have you heard? It's Jared. And I was like, was he shot? Like, like you know, like, I know there's going to be fatalities. Like, was he one of them? She's like, no, dude. Like, he was a person who shot everyone. And I was just beyond shock. But what drove this lifelong resident of Tucson to commit such a devastating rampage? A ruthless spree that shook his local community to the core. At around 10.10 10 a.m. on the 8th of January 2011, Jared Lofner committed a deadly killing spree in Tucson, Arizona. In just 17 seconds, he emptied a 33-round magazine of its bullets into a waiting crowd. The ruthless attack would ultimately leave six dead and 13 wounded. Customers have tackled the suspect. They are holding him down at the Safeway. In an act of heroism, bystanders subdued the shooter, ending the killing spree quickly as it had begun. It was just an eerie scene of people dead, taking their last breaths. There was some uh, cries of panic, nothing loud, and, um, and then Nothing. Five minutes after the last bullet was fired, police arrived on the scene, where Lofner was immediately placed in handcuffs and removed from the devastating aftermath of his killing spree. The first thing he said to law enforcement is, I want everyone to know that there was no one else involved. He wanted everyone to know that this was him and him alone. With Lofner safely in custody, people began to take stock of themselves and those around them. 
Jared Loftner at this time was in the back of the car uh, of one of the police cars. Um, to be honest, I didn't pay him any mind at that point because we needed to render aid to the victims. There wasn't that mass chaos, a mass of people running like you would almost expect. It's almost like they came together and began to help each other. I had my blinders on and I was, I was taking care of the people that were right here. I'm laying there, my glasses are broken. I grabbed my cell phone out of my pocket and I clipped my number here at the house and Sally answered the phone and I said, Sally, I've been shot, but I'm okay, but I need you here right away. I mean, I actually said to him, what do you mean? I thought maybe there'd been a robbery. I simply didn't know. He told me where he was and when I got off the phone, I immediately forgot. I was just absolutely in shock. A nine-year-old child was also amongst the victims that morning. Well, the, the one memory that I don't think I will ever be able to purge from my brain is looking over and seeing one-handed CPR being done on a tiny little nine-year-old girl. I realized how desperate it was when Somebody came up to me and said, there's a little girl. And it doesn't look like she's going to make it. Tragically, on the way to hospital, she died. Amongst those critically wounded was Congresswoman Gabrielle Giffords with a serious gunshot wound to the head. Jared Loughner's bloody rampage had left 13 people seriously wounded and six dead. Bill did what he did by knocking this man to the ground and holding him there was of absolutely no surprise to me whatsoever because that's Bill's character. That's, that's how Bill's made. Along with the young child, five adults were also victims of the brutal spree Dorothy Morris, Judge John Roll, Phyllis Sheck, Dorwin Stoddard and Gabe Zimmerman all lost their lives at the hands of one man, Jared Lee Loughner. The 9th of March, 2011, Arizona Superior Court. Jared Lee Loughner was initially charged on 49 counts. If he was found guilty, he would face the death sentence. At his first court hearing in May um, 2011, he had an outburst. He was, he was uh, uh, disconnected from what was going on. I think Jared Loughner was a, a very confused young man who was spiraling into to madness. Throughout the proceedings, Loughner's behavior deteriorated and he had to be forcibly removed from court. Deemed unfit to stand trial, he was remanded in custody where his mental health declined further. He was in just terrible shape. He was psychotic, he was having hallucinations. At one point he paced for 50 hours in a cell, got open literally for 50 hours straight. He got open sores on his feet, those became infected. 26th of June, 2011. Diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia, the trial judge ruled that Loughner should be forcibly medicated with antipsychotics. There's, there is a possibility that Loughner believed he was killing evil people. Uh, he was doing us a big favor, ridding the world of evil. And this was just a, an act that he knew he had to fulfill because these were very bad forces working on our society, and he was doing us a favor. After 14 months, he was deemed competent to stand trial, where the prosecution was seeking the death penalty. I think he and his representation saw the writing on the wall. He would have been executed. 
In an eventual plea bargain, Lofner admitted guilt to 19 of the 49 original charges, including attempted assassination of a congresswoman, the murder of two federal employees, causing the death of four others, attempted murder of two federal employees, and injuring 10 others through the use of a pistol. The shooting really shook this town. And people reacted with grief, mourning, just utter shock. I've always known that I was going to see things that most people don't see, but never to the magnitude of this incident. We survived, so we try to be a voice for the people who will no longer have a voice. By admitting his guilt, Lofner avoided the death penalty. That day will be forever emblazoned on my mind and in my heart and on my soul as the very worst day of my life. Jared Lee Lofner was given seven consecutive life terms plus 140 years, meaning under current law he will never be released. Now this guy has got to spend the rest of his life living with the consequences of what he did. Since the shooting spree, mental health and gun control laws have again become the focus of fierce debate throughout America. I think for our people who have mental problems, we need to help them. We can't just push them out there and let them do something like this. It kind of drew a line in of who do you really know? And you say you know someone, but do you really know them? You were not going to find the red flags in his childhood. And that's because he had a genetically determined illness, schizophrenia, uh, that doesn't appear in terms of symptoms until an individual is in his late teens or early 20s. You get a different Jared Loeffner at that point. And this one turned out to be extremely violent. In 2011, a 28-hour killing spree unfolded in New York City. The amount of mayhem and murder that he left behind, it's truly amazing. Slashing his way through the streets. There was a whole pool of blood near that tree over there. Maxim Gelman was a man on a mission of murder. It was almost as he was a robot and he was programmed to kill. As the clock ticked, the body count rose. It seems to me he was going to kill anybody in his way. And with it, the question, what caused this small-time crook to commit his killing spree? He knew what he did was wrong, but he simply didn't care. of February 2011, 9 a.m. The typical hustle and bustle of the city that never sleeps belied the fact that this was a day unlike any other. A killing spree was underway. There were hundreds of cops and detectives that were assigned to this. We were pulling people from all over the place. Anybody who was, uh, was working at that point in the detective bureau was assigned to this case. Detectives were frantically searching for Maxim Gelman, the man who over the last 28 hours had left four dead and three critically injured in a string of vicious stabbings, random carjackings, and indiscriminate assaults. He was being reckless. He was committing crimes in public. He was driving around at a high rate of speed. Concerns were mounting that the out-of-control killer would soon strike again. Not only are you trying to contain what's, what's happening, but you're trying to find this guy so that he doesn't hurt anybody else. 
So there is a lot of pressure that's put on the police department in a situation like this. He was, it seems, uh, becoming more and more unhinged and perhaps becoming more and more dangerous at the same time. The hunt for Maxim Gelman sprawled across the length and breadth of the city. New York City is a big place. You can hide just about anywhere. This is a dynamic situation that we're dealing with. We have enough resources in New York City to do this. We have the dogs and the helicopters and the license plate readers and the cars and the number of cops. But still, he's all over the place. And we don't know where he's going to pop up next. The indiscriminate nature of the crimes committed meant that even a chance encounter with New York's most wanted man could prove fatal. There was a sense of danger because people were realizing their life could be threatened. And it would not be because he hated them or because he had a grudge against them. It was because he was a guy who was out on the streets in public with knives and who was willing, apparently, to attack and maybe even kill anybody who got in his way. That same morning, Joe Lazito, a box office ticket seller from Philadelphia, was taking his daily commute into Manhattan, unaware of the drama that was unfolding. I got up super early. I had to make the commute. And everything that he had done the day before had not yet made it to the Philadelphia papers. So I was going into the city blind. I had no idea. While his day had begun like any other, Joe would make a seemingly innocent decision that would change his life. When I arrived at Penn Station that day, there was construction on the one train on the tracks. When I got up to the platform, I had to make a decision. Do I stay on this platform or do I go to the other platform? For whatever reason this day, I decided, well, let me go to the other platform. It's double the trains. I'll get to work a lot quicker. A suspected sighting of the spree killer had investigators scouring the subway system. He was known to be in one set of tunnels connected to one subway line in one section of Manhattan. It was at this point that the cordon began tightening. The thing that really uh, sent up a red flag were two police officers got on the train and they went right into the motorman's compartment. So the police are actually driving with the conductors going southbound trains and northbound trains looking through the tunnels because this is where we believe he is. What I noticed is when they got on, their radios were blasting. They were on full blast. They were loud, they were active, and it was definitely different than the norm. Finally, the doors closed, and now we're moving at a snail's pace. So then I was really like, what's going on here? As the train finally pulled away from Penn Station, Joe was about to come face to face with Maxim Gelman, the most wanted man in New York City. This guy just walks right in front of me and starts banging on the door to the uh, motorman's compartment. And uh, he looked kind of dirty, um, disheveled. And he starts banging on the door, and he says, let me in. And I'm sitting here going, what is going on with this guy? And lo and behold, Max is on the train where the cops are riding with the conductors looking for him. Max turns around, and he focuses in on one of the passengers who happened to be probably the biggest guy on the train, this guy, Joe Lazito. So the next thing I know, he's about uh, two feet from me and about three feet from the door looks right down at me I look up at him we make eye contact he uh, takes out this big knife looks me dead in the eye and says you're gonna die in 2011 New York City would be struck by a killing spree. Carrying out a series of stabbings, carjackings and assaults, 
Maxim Gelman would stalk the streets for 28 hours. 1994, New York City. 17 years before the deadly spree, six-year-old Maxim Gelman and his mother Svetlana immigrated to the United States from Ukraine, settling in the Sheepshead Bay neighborhood at Brooklyn's southern tip. His father had left him early on in life. His mother remarried, lived uh, with his mom uh, and his stepfather. He had no brothers and sisters. He was an only child. His early years would entail a succession of setbacks and personal struggles to find acceptance in his new surroundings. Max, when he was young, he was uh, an outsider. He definitely didn't have a lot of friends, maybe felt shy or wasn't confident enough in himself. I guess that's what kind of made him into a worse person. Gelman's childhood was filled with trouble. His uh, potential for killing was something that developed early and remained with him until he was in his early 20s. Life at home was also turbulent for the young Maxim. Max and his family, he wasn't so great with them. Max uh, expressed some uh, dislike in the way uh, his stepfather treated his mother. He you know, loved and respected his mother but his stepfather never respected him. He would always refer to his father as asshole in front of anyone, you know. I don't think that they ever had a normal relationship. It turned out to be a somewhat violent relationship. Gelman's battles with his stepfather were repeated, and the pair's obvious lack of affection for one another would prove an omen for the pointed altercation that was to come. The 11th of February, 2011, 5 a.m. The now 23-year-old Maxim Gelman was on the way to visit his mother. It was to be for the last time. Maxim Gelman went to his mother's house looking for his passport. Max thought he was being followed by the FBI and the DEA and the, he just called them the feds a lot of times. And he was worried that the police were onto him because he was an alleged drug dealer and he wanted to flee the country. He got there, uh, he knocked on the door, he got in. And this is where he runs into his uh, stepfather. Of course, at this point, Maxim appears to have been behaving in a pretty erratic fashion. That could have been enough to, to start tension with anybody. Believed to be under the influence of drugs, Gelman's curious behavior quickly began to arouse the suspicions of his parents. Max got into an argument with his mother and his stepfather regarding the car. He wanted the keys because his feeling, um, uh, and one might call delusions about the DEA out to get him. His behavior was really unusual. He was becoming more disturbing. The tensions rising inside the Gelman house were about to erupt. Something in Max's head at that point, at that point, snapped. And, you know, he picked up the weapon of opportunity at that point, which was the knife. Unleashing a display of savage violence, Maxim's anger would boil over into murder. He stabbed his stepfather over 50 times. A knife is a much more personal weapon. Almost anybody can be trained to pull a trigger, but to actually plunge a knife into the body of a victim until he's dead indicates a, a tremendous amount of anger. The wounds were incredibly severe. He couldn't have survived that. There was very close range stab, and that sort of gave me the impression that Max was acting out of some sort of more than natural rage. The other thing, of course, it can tell us about Gelman is that Gelman was a very 
a spontaneous individual and his rage was very quick to flourish and long lasting. After his mother called 911, NYPD detective Joe Jackalone would begin to coordinate a response to Gelman's crime. At that point, it was just a domestic violence murder. That's, that's the way it was being handled. It was a, a fight between the stepfather and the stepson, and it ended in murder. And that we were looking for this guy, Max and Gelman. We, we knew his name at this point, but we didn't understand the consequences of what else was happening. With the information available in these early stages, few could have foreseen the frenzy that was to come. With the blood of his stepfather on his hands and authorities heading his way, Gelman fled. So he figures he needs to get out of town at this point, so he takes everything and he leaves. Initially, from what we've, we know, he was on his way out and then decided to come back in and figure now, now he wants to settle some scores. While detectives began their investigation at the Gelman house, Maxim would head back into the city and towards the home of 20-year-old Yelena Bulchenko. Wait, just make the camera lower so it's not like I'm like, being recorded. Yelena was a very pretty girl. She was smart. Uh, she was funny. A uh, very sensitive, very sweet girl. And we already made plans for Valentine's Day. You know, I bought her a heart necklace. Uh, everything was set in place. Yelena and Gerard were no strangers to Maxim Gelman. Me, Yelena, and him had drove, driven to Long Island to visit someone, and things went well. I mean, there was nothing out of the ordinary. We were with each other, basically, for most of the morning. Gelman, however, seemed to believe that he and Yelena were more than just friends. He really liked it. And she didn't feel that way. His attitude towards relationships with women was one scarred by a sordid early encounter. He never really had a girlfriend. And I think what really tore him from reality is his first sexual experience. He had sex with a girl from the high school and I think after that, he ended up getting a serious STD. How he told me was that he has lumps and that they weren't able to be even surgically removed. He kind of knew that he wouldn't be able to have a normal life anymore. Him and Yelena would really never be able to be a couple. He fixated on Yelena an individual who showed him some kindness in passing, and that became so much more meaningful to him because he had nothing else in his life. Although his advances were rejected, Gelman would continue to pursue Yelena. Yelena changed her number because Max kept on, you know, calling her over and over and over again uh, to the point where she was, you know, she, was, she didn't want to have that you know she didn't want him to be bothered you know she was in a relationship with me she didn't want to you know be stalked i think yelena's rejection really caused him to kind of become a stalker he had showed up at her house one time he was looking for her he started banging on the door going crazy um saying you know i'll kill you if you don't open the door and all these different types of things she had really little interest in speaking with him, but his, the way he was reacting to her made some people say, in retrospect, that uh, there were warning signs that he could become very dangerous. The 11th of February, 2011, 10 a.m., five hours since the spree began. Sheepshead Bay, New York. Located merely a few blocks from the scene of his previous crime, Gelman would arrive at the Bulchenko residence. He drove to Yelena's mother's house and confronted her while she was on the phone. The person that was on the phone was able to overhear the conversation that was going on. And from what the, the caller stated was that you could tell it was an argument right off the bat. Max wanted to know where Yelena was. And Yelena's mom didn't want to give it up. 
Anna's refusal to divulge the details of her daughter's whereabouts meant she would face the sharp end of Maxim's violent temper. Max grabs the knife. You know, he just puncturing, you know, the mother, like torturing her kind of thing, where he's trying to get information out of her where Yelena is. I think that Max probably knew that he was not going to get away with his crimes and that it would more satisfy him to do what he had to do uh, and, you know, in terms of the consequences, let him, you know, he didn't care. And eventually, I think Max just gets tired of the, of the game that he's playing with her and, and he finally plunges the knife into her and kills her. The injuries were similar to the injuries to his stepfather, pretty much violent multiple stab wounds. Anna is protecting her daughter at all costs, and she makes the ultimate sacrifice. Oblivious to the horrors unfolding at her home, Yelena would get wind of Gelman's earlier crimes. Yelena got a phone call letting her know that, you know, Max had killed his father in the morning. Now, this is around 3 o'clock, you know, 3.30, as Yelena's walking home. Max got back in his car and he was driving up and down the blocks and just looking for any sign of her. And during this time period, Yelena comes home. On her arrival, Yelena would be confronted by a scene of cruel violence. She discovered her mother's body and, you know, freaked out as anybody would. It was a terribly horrendous, bloody scene. And she is now outside of her house crying and she's calling on the, the cell phone, calling the police, calling anybody who will, uh, you know, come and help her. I get a phone call out of nowhere from Yelena's friend. And she tells me, oh, Yelena's mom has been stabbed. And I'm like, what? What are you talking about? What are you talking about? I, at first I thought, you know, this was a prank, stupid prank call. I was like, you know, stop playing with me. You know, it's not cool. She's like, no, I'm serious. Yelena just got off the phone with me. So I was like, all right, I'm on my way. Yet unbeknownst to Gerard, he was not the only one heading in Yelena's direction. At this time, Max arrives back at the house after failing to find her uh, at work or out in the street. To see him there, she probably put two and two together pretty quickly. So she runs to a neighbor Gerard's concern for the safety of his girlfriend would quickly develop. We were just driving as fast and fast as possible, running red lights, doing whatever we needed to do to get there. I, uh, I kept on calling and calling. The more I kept on trying, the more nervous I became. Uh, and I started going crazy in the back seat of the car. You know, this can't be real. This can't be happening. I started crying, going crazy, yelling, screaming, get there, get there. You gotta be there, we gotta get there, we gotta know what's going on. As an argument ensued outside the Bulchenko home, Gelman was determined to take revenge against Yelena for her rejection of him. Max basically overpowers a neighbor and just goes to kill her, and he stabs her, and he walks away. He gets in the car, and I guess he figures that, you know, what happens if she's still alive? So he gets back out of the car, and, and basically in front of people, he stabs her again. He really wanted her dead. Eleven hours into his spree, Maxim Gelman was now responsible for the death of a third innocent victim. My friends and I parked right near the police barricade, and I just jumped over the barricade. And, uh, you know, there was cops all in front of her house. And I ran over near her house, and then I guess the police didn't see me at first. So the police grabbed me and said, who are you, who are you? I was like, I'm, I'm her boyfriend, where, where is she? And she wasn't there, and there was a whole pool of blood on that, near that tree over there. And you can just see that this is something that, something that doesn't normally happen, uh, something outrageous, something crazy. On 
On examining the evidence at their disposal, the reality of the danger they were facing began to dawn on detectives. After this incident, we're starting to, the police are starting to put two and two together, that there is a link between all of these murders. And if we don't stop this guy, he's going to kill more people. There's no question about it. The most dangerous person to deal with in the world is that person who has nothing to lose. The 11th of February, 2011, 4.30 p.m. A killing spree was underway in New York. The normally quiet neighborhood of Sheep's Head Bay was at its epicenter. Having murdered his stepfather at 5 a.m. that morning, Maxim Gelman had now claimed the lives of three in little over 11 hours. As investigators descended on the scene of his latest double crime, the slayings of mother and daughter Anna and Yelena Bulchenko, an increasingly out of control Gelman would attempt to evade their attentions. Max fled in a hurry uh, after killing Yelena. Max just was enraged and uh, determined to kill. In making his getaway, Gelman would again demonstrate his apparent disregard for anyone who might stand in his way. As he's fleeing, he runs over Stephen Tannenbaum, who was uh, an older gentleman. He was actually a coin collector and dealer, and he was in the crosswalk, and, and Max just ran him down. And he, was, he was pretty much dead at the scene. He just kept on driving, didn't stop, didn't flinch, he just kept on going. Now that detectives understood they were dealing with a spree of connected killings, their efforts to apprehend the culprit would intensify. However, finding one man amongst a city of millions posed police with a significant problem. You have to learn how to play chess as the police, where you have to think sometimes two or three moves ahead of the bad guy. One of the first steps when you're what we call hunting for a known perpetrator is you try to find out where they've been in the past, where they've lived, who their friends are, uh, if he's ever been arrested anywhere else, because these are the places that you'd likely show up again. Leaving no stone unturned, detectives would enlist known associates of Gelman to assist with the search. We got a you know, strong knock on our door, and I opened it, and there were probably around eight detectives asking me about Max. And they said, you know, Max murdered someone. But they asked me to maybe help them to look for him. I was uh, basically driving with the police, and it was really insane. I couldn't believe the amount of police that there were outside. Gelman, however, was able to stay one step ahead of his pursuers, turning his knowledge of the city's abandoned train tracks to his advantage. The train tracks that Maxim Gelman apparently used as a getaway route uh, are in a really desolate area. They run along a, a sunken bed that cuts through neighborhoods. His understanding of this underground network had developed during his years as a graffiti writer. When we would write together, uh, we only wrote like in, uh, in places where it was kind of abandoned, where nobody would be around us. Maxim would use his artistic outlet to express his attitudes on the way he viewed the world. He would write things like, uh, nothing to lose, you know, just these, like, hopeless kind of quotes. I, I guess he was looking for help, but he didn't know how to find it. His reputation as an eccentric would also develop amongst those that moved in the same circles. He would make, uh, you know, voices. If a gangster or what you see on TV, you know, a mobster, when he would start an altercation with somebody, he would talk to him in this voice, and people just thought, like, what's wrong with this guy? He was just... Uh, 
You know, I guess the sick person. Gelman's affectations towards the gangster lifestyle would eventually be reflected in his reality. From what I know, he was selling, you know, cocaine. He was selling heroin. You know, he was selling pills and all types of different things. He was involved in terms of his drug uh, use with angel dust or PCP. It's a drug that's not common among drug users because of the ill effects that it has. It takes over a person's whole mind. It can lead to aggressive, um, violent behavior. Years before the spree began, friends would come face to face with Maxim's violent unpredictability. I'm just walking down the street and uh, Max sees me in his car and he pulls over and he jumps out with a knife and he definitely wanted to, you know, cause harm to me. And he was, you know, basically jabbing a knife at me. Max was very unpredictable and he was very dangerous. You know, this was somebody who you can't imagine is actually out on the streets. The 12th of February, 2011, 1 a.m. Crown Heights, Brooklyn. Five miles away and eight hours on from his last confirmed sighting, Maxim Gelman would begin the second stage of his ever escalating spree. Maxim Gelman had not been seen for several hours, but around 1 a.m. he showed up in Crown Heights, uh, some distance away from Midwood, where the police were looking for him. Max shows back up on, on the grid, and he decides that he needs another car, he needs to still get away, so he comes across uh, a livery cab that's parked on the side of the road. For the driver of the cab, Fitz Fullerton, it would be a fare he would never forget. Maxim got into the back seat, then as they were driving along, he attempted to commandeer the cab. He tried to take it over, and the taxi crashed, and Maxim fled. He had stabbed the, the, the driver, and he had left. So, you know, fortunately, he survives. Now Max is still on the hunt for another car. Now he probably realizes once this gets notified to the police that the police are going to have a beat on him where he's showing up next. Gelman, however, was not to be deterred in his quest to commandeer a car. A matter of minutes later, and little more than a mile away from the Fitz Fullerton scene, he would strike again. He comes across Sheldon Pottinger, who is outside of the church waiting for his family to come out. He jumps into the car, and he takes off in the car. He stabs Sheldon, and he tells him, as he's driving 60, 70 miles an hour, he tells him <laughs> to get out. And can you imagine being in this position where you've just been stabbed, your car jacked, and now you're driving 60, 70, 80 miles an hour, wherever it may be, and he tells you, your best bet is to jump out of a car to survive. Well, Sheldon jumps out of the car. He miraculously survives. This guy was driving fast. And I pushed myself out of the car, hold the knife, and I hoping to do, I push myself out, and I fell on the floor. I get up and I start running. I run back down to the church. Gelman would, however, leave behind a clue that would prove crucial in his undoing. He abandoned the Nissan near a subway station in Queens, and what he did for the next few hours is unclear. When we found out about Sheldon Pottinger's car, that, that license plate immediately transmitted to every police officer in the city that's working. And a couple of patrol cops in Queens stumble, stumble upon the car near the subway station. So uh, the police start to put two and two together that he probably hopped on a train. With detectives now alerted to Gelman's most recent movements, the elusive killer would once again go to ground. He was next seen hours later, around 8.30 a.m., uh, in the subway system in Manhattan. As the spree entered its 28th hour, news of Gelman's exploits had made the front page. Max is on the downtown train. And as he's walking through the cars, he sees his face on the front of one of the newspapers. And he, he pretty much, you know, knocks the paper out of the woman's hand. She became very frightened and upset. She got off the subway. Uh, she found police officers on the subway platform and told them that she was pretty sure she had just encountered Maxim Gelman. 
the irrationality of Gelman clearly shows that he wasn't acting on thought or cognition. Gelman, of course, is a spontaneous reactor. He's not a planner, he's not a thinker, he's just enjoying the high and living it while he can. With reports regarding Gelman's whereabouts reaching police, the focus of the citywide search would narrow, centering in on the network of tunnels running beneath the streets. There are very few ways to get out of the subway system. In order for him to get out of that subway system now, it would take like an actor Houdini to get out. Gelman, it seemed, had backed himself into a corner. The police set up a checkpoint at Penn Station. Uh, Max's train was coming their way. Yet even with the odds of escape stacked against him, Gelman would make another move that kept him a step ahead of the pursuing police. He got off the train and left not via the platform, but jumped onto the subway tracks, crossed several tracks, and then pulled himself into a train going the opposite direction. And he is actually heading towards the busiest transit hub probably in the world, Times Square. With nowhere left to run, Maxim Gelman would make one last desperate play, and in doing so, thrust unsuspecting commuter Joe Lazito to the center of the story. Max decides that he's going to, to hijack the train. So he's banging on the door of the conductor. He was banging on the door. He was announcing that he was an official visitor. And at this point, Max turns around and he grabs a hold of Joe Lazito. I looked in his eyes, he looked in my eyes. There was nothing there. It was the whole lights are on, but nobody's home. I mean, it was almost as he was a robot and he was programmed to kill. The part where he takes the knife out really happened in slow motion. The initial stab almost seemed matter-of-factly. He took out the knife, it was huge and it was filthy, and he plunges the knife right into my face right here. I said, okay, we're in a fight now. There's no thought process. It's like you're in a savage mode. It's just survival. I kind of propelled myself from the seat. Now he has free reign of the back of my head. And uh, obviously at that point, I can't see what he looks like. When he was stabbing me, when he was slicing me. It was just a sense of urgency trying to get the knife away from me. The first time he swung up at me, I tried to catch his wrist and I missed and he sliced me in the thumb. The second time he sliced up at me, I missed again and he sliced my tricep. Finally, the third time he sliced his arm up, I caught it with my hand, I slammed his hand down and the knife came out. That's how I disarmed him. After 28 hours, Gelman's cruel killing spree had been brought to an end by the bravery of just one man. After I disarmed him, that's when the police came out of the motorman's compartment and tapped me on the shoulder and said, you can get up, we got him. Yet despite Joe's heroics, the injuries he had sustained were severe. While this was going on, I am sitting on the subway seat I just looked at Gelman and I said, you better hope I die because if I don't, I'm going to come back and kill you. In February 2011, New York City was subject to a 28-hour killing spree. Beginning in Brooklyn, Maxim Gelman would take the lives of four and injure four more in a series of stabbings, carjackings and assaults. The spree would finally come to a close in the center of the Manhattan subway system, after passenger Joe Lazito disarmed New York's most wanted man in hand-to-hand -hand combat. By 9 o'clock in the morning, the, this, this finally came to a conclusion when the officer was able to handcuff him and get an ambulance, get some help for uh, the passenger. That, that had been stabbed. I mean, this, this poor guy was very fortunate to be alive. 
In the aftermath of the altercation, Joe was now left fighting for survival. While I was sitting there and uh, watching my life pour out of me, I'm screaming. We have to get this train moving. I'm going to die. I can't die on this train. When they lifted me from the seat, I passed out. And when they put me down, I snapped out of it, and I was up again. And that, that moment, that was the first time I had felt any pain. It was the worst pain I'd ever felt. Joe would soon begin to learn just how lucky he was to be alive. And I heard one of the officers call me likely, and I didn't know what that meant. And later on at the hospital, uh, my sister, who was also a New York City police officer, she goes, Joseph, do you know what that means? I said, no, no. She goes, that means likely to die. Befitting the events of this unimaginable story, its end would come in one of New York's most iconic locations. Ironically, this all occurs above 42nd Street in Times Square, the crossroads of the world. He's walked out of the subway into the back of a police car in front of thousands of people watching what's going on. But when the word goes out that he was, he was finally under police control, I mean, everybody, it was just a sigh of relief. I remember sitting in the office and going, you know, you know, whew, I thank God that's over. Without the actions of Joe Lozito that morning, the number of victims claimed by Gelman could have been far higher. I've been called a hero, and, and I'm so appreciative for it, but that's not me. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not a hero. I, I just I did what had to be done that day. In court, Gelman would show little contrition. Instead, he would glory in the notoriety he had gained. I would call his sentence a performance rather than a sentence. His actions in, in Brooklyn court that day were like every other thing he's ever done. They're deplorable. He kept on looking over to me, smiling, you know, saying stupid things under his breath towards me, looking at me. I had to take measures to stop him from talking, and, um, but he always wanted to get it out. I, I don't know if he was trying to create that gangster persona because he knew that he was going to spend the rest of his life in jail. However, despite his despicable behavior, the victims of his crimes would be given a chance to have the last word. I tried my best, you know, to, to keep my cool, but he kept on looking at me, and he kept on giving me a smirk and laughing or smiling. And that's what got me. I mean, in my mind, I was thinking, you know, can I, can I kill him in the courtroom? So this is like looking in the face of evil. And I told him, I was like, you're gonna, you're gonna burn in hell. I played out the scenario in my head about a thousand times. I visualized what I wanted to say to him. It was a little nerve wracking, to be honest, but I looked at Max and I told him I had waited over a year to look into those eyes again. I told him that, uh, you know, I hope he enjoyed life in prison and that he had hell to look forward to. Maxim Gelman would plead guilty to each of his 13 charges including the murders of his stepfather, Alexander Kuznetsov, Anna and Yelena Bolchenko, and Stephen Tannenbaum. He would be sentenced to a total of 225 years behind bars. With the facts of this entirely unprecedented case established, a crucial question still burned brightly. What could have caused Maxim Gelman to conduct his killing spree? Was his plan that day to do all these things, or was it just he snapped and, uh, and went off on the deep end because of the father in the morning? You know, we'll never know. At best, he had some form of paranoid element to his personality, where his ways of interpreting the world and understanding what the world means is seriously disordered. The only motivation I could think that Max would try to do this is, be, you know, he had a long history of drug use. Maybe the drugs, you know, affected his brain in in, in certain way, and just made him snap. While there was never a determination that Max was legally insane, 
he was certainly exhibit, exhibiting evidence of psychosis and, and sociopathic and psychopathic behavior. So the, that's the place they're in. Um, they're in a different place than a normal human being. Upbringing probably has a lot to do with it. But there are productive members of society who had terrible upbringings, and they were able to overcome it. You know, we know that he was not suffering from some severe mental illness. He knew what he did was wrong, but he simply didn't care. He chose to do it, and he was able to kill with moral impunity. I think Gelman could represent a new, different type of spree killer that, that we haven't really seen much of before. He's an incidental spree killer. He's trying to escape, he's desperate to get away, and he will kill people if he has to. There is little doubt that the lives of those who lost loved ones will never be the same again. Elena was a beautiful girl, smart, had an enormous future in front of her that was taken, you know? Her brother lost a sister. Her brother lost a mother. Her father lost everybody. He's in the house alone now. Um, and I just hope that Maxim is suffering. I sit here before you today knowing how lucky I am because I have no business being here. I should be dead. I should have been his fifth victim. For Gerard, of all the difficult questions posed by the events of that day, the hardest one to ask is what if. I drive around this neighborhood a lot and I never come up the block. Um, it just brings me back to that day. It feels like it was yesterday, you know? You keep on thinking in your head, if I was here or if I, was, I didn't go to work that day, or if I uh, was here 20 minutes, 30 minutes earlier, could I have stopped them? In 1982, 40-year-old George Emile Banks embarked on a ruthless rampage that would shock America to the core. Something in him just snapped. When he pulled the gun up and aimed it at me, I knew he was going to pull the trigger. As the clock ticked, the body count rose. Right about in here is where the two victims were laying, right on the street. And with it, the question, why had the ex-prison guard from Pennsylvania brutally murdered his own flesh and blood? There was a lady holding a baby, he shot her and the baby. And committed a brutal killing spree that would ultimately claim 13 lives in a matter of hours. But of the rifle was coming through the window and George starts screaming at us, he's gonna kill everybody. Barry, Pennsylvania. During the 1950s and 60s, this once prosperous city in the northeast of the United States suffered a collapse of a booming coal mining industry, making life tough going for its residents. The city's economy partially recovered during the 1970s, but this decade of growth also experienced a huge setback in the form of a colossal tropical storm. Wilkes-Barre endured almost $1 billion worth of damage. But one of the worst moments in the city's turbulent history would undoubtedly be remembered for the actions of just one man during one unforgettable night. On an early September morning in 1982, the residents of Wilkes-Barre woke to the horrifying news that one of America's worst ever mass murders had just been committed on their very doorstep, and the man responsible had still not been caught. It was horrific, it's something that you would only see in a movie. Hundreds of police officers, along with countless journalists and onlookers, had surrounded a nondescript two-story house on Monroe Street. Detective Jim Zardecki was one of the first on the scene. 
all of a sudden we heard the smashing of the glass and I looked up there at that window and the butt of the rifle was coming through the window. Inside, one man was engaged in a standoff. I heard a policeman yell, we have them in our sights. And I'm thinking, are they going to kill him? The man sheltered behind the second floor window was George Emile Banks, who in a matter of hours had embarked on a killing spree that had left 13 people dead. Seven of the victims were children. But what had driven this 40-year-old Wilkes-Barre resident to embark on such a violent killing spree? And why had he ended up barricaded into an empty building on Monroe Street just hours later? 2.30 a.m., the 25th of September, 1982, Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania, just 10 hours before the siege on Monroe Street. Several miles away, a 22-year-old, James Olson, had been attending a house party. It was a pre-Halloween party. All of our friends got together, and some were dressed up somewhere. We were in the house partying, they were, everybody was having drinks, having fun. It was, it was actually a good party. I went outside to get another bottle of booze out of my trunk and my car. And this is when we heard the noises. The, it's like somebody's throwing firecrackers. We couldn't figure out what it was. So then we just see this gentleman walk out of the house with the camel. He had a camel hat on. My buddy Ray Hall says to him, hey, I know you, and pointed to him, and he turned the gun, he had the gun at the side like this, picked the gun up and shot him. I thought they were pulling a gag on me. It wasn't a gag, it's far from it. Especially when he turned the gun to me and said, you're not gonna live long enough to tell nobody about this. All I can remember is the eyes. He just had that look about him, like, this is it. I knew he was going to pull the trigger. That's something that's in my head will be there probably for the rest of my life. Across the other side of town, Jim Zardecki was at home when his night's sleep was cut short. I got a call from our chief deputy coroner telling me that there was a homicide in Wilkesboro. Whilst Zardecki raced across the city, Local police were arriving on the scene at Schoolhouse Lane. There they found James Olson and Ray Hall critically wounded. And when I got shot, the bullet, when it went through, it just like pulled the life out of me. It's like Jesus Christ himself reached down and like, like pulled my insides out. Like it was just a, a really empty feeling. Leaving two men for dead, the gunman was immediately on the move. He walked down the street backwards, holding the rifle like this. Walked down the street, and from what my friends tell me, of course, because I was already shot at the time, he had put the gun to someone's head at the end of the street and stole their car. Local tow truck driver Bobby Kadlebowski was working the area when he came across the unfolding events. The night of the shooting, uh, this was the scene where it was lined with police, ambulances, and, and all type of uh, rescue units and stuff. And right in this general area right here, probably right about, right about in here is where the two victims were laying, right on the street. Police frantically tried to save Ray Hall's life. The officer actually had, uh, had a rag trying to stop the blood flow, and I, I just knew in my heart that this guy wasn't going to make it. Ray Hall died at the scene, whilst James Olson was rushed to hospital with serious gunshot wounds. Police began to piece together the chain of events. Witnesses reported that the man suspected of the shooting had exited a building just metres away. The same building from which James and Ray had heard strange noises emanating only moments earlier. What police discovered inside turned an apparent shooting of two into a fully-fledged killing spree. When we came in and we walked into the house, we were able to see the bodies just strewn all over the living room at that point in time. I looked around, I saw bodies covered up, blood on the walls. 
Uh, he just turned around and went back out. I didn't want to see any more. The house belonged to 40-year-old ex-prison guard George Emil Banks. Inside, eight members of his family lay dead, and Banks was nowhere to be found. In the early hours of the 25th of September, 1982, Wilkes-Barre police reported to a house party where two people had been shot, one fatally. As they investigated further, the apparent shooting of two turned out to be far worse. In a house just meters away, they discovered the bodies of three women and five children. The hunt was on to catch a spree killer, and ex-prison guard George Emil Banks was identified as the prime suspect. George Banks was born to mixed race parents on the 22nd of June, 1942. His mother was white, his father was black, and uh, in his early days, um, growing up in Wilkesburg, Pennsylvania, where you had a African-American population of far less than 1%, and coming from a biracial family for George Banks, that was extremely difficult. During the early 1940s, parts of America were still struggling with segregation. At that time period when George was growing up, there were still some racial tensions, you know, between African Americans and whites. So it wasn't the, exactly the best time period to grow up in, but, uh, you know, his, his family tried to make the best of it. Banks's parents never married, and the family's racial mix seemed to torment him throughout his life. Psychiatrists would say, of course, that the experiences George went through could lead to him hating himself and disliking his own black identity. The fact that he was mixed race made him feel he wasn't accepted by either black people or white people in the community. George continued to struggle with this perceived racial prejudice throughout his late teens, prompting him to enlist into the military as a means of escaping his troubled youth. So after high school, uh, George enrolled in the military, but the problem was George wasn't the type of person who liked to take orders. He always liked to be in, in control of his own life. He liked to be in control of uh, others around him, so he couldn't take orders well from superiors, and that ultimately resulted in uh, him getting an early discharge. From this point on, Banks's life continued on a downward spiral, until at the age of 19, he found himself in serious trouble with the law. One night, he and some accomplices tried to break into a local bar. The bar owner was there, and Banks shot him in the chest at point-blank range. It was like a botched armed robbery. Uh, they ended up getting caught. Uh, I believe the sentence was five to seven years he had received. However, uh, while he was serving his time, uh, he actually escaped during a work detail. Uh, he was caught within five hours, and uh, they added another one to seven years to his sentence. After spending seven and a half years behind bars, Banks was finally released from prison and straight back into the community he had so despised as a youth. The 25th of September, 1982, 3 a.m., 13 years after Banks' release from prison, police had been called to Schoolhouse Lane in Wilkes-Barre to investigate the shooting of two men. But on their arrival, they uncovered another bloody scene that was even harder to comprehend. The killing spree had actually started in a nearby property, the home of George Banks. The policemen that were at the scene, who the first responders, had identified the culprit as being George Banks. When I walked in, there were multiple bodies in the house. And you start looking around and see that you know, this was far more than just a normal homicide. It appeared to be a targeted uh, murder at that time. Banks had woken hours earlier, having partially slept off a cocktail of drink and drugs. His killing spree was spontaneous. Uh, he actually may have snapped, and he may have suffered from some profound psychological disorder. It was at that moment uh, he decided to act. 
He picked up his AR-15 assault rifle. He put a 30-round clip in the gun. His first victim was fellow resident Regina Clemens. Banks then made his way through the house, shooting as he went. There were shell casings, uh, bodies everywhere. It was just a horrific scene. Within just a few moments, all of the occupants downstairs were dead. Banks then turned his attention to the second floor. He ruthlessly killed everyone in his path, even targeting defenseless children. I can remember being absolutely shocked walking in there. I, I had been in the DA's office since 1972. Uh, I had seen literally, I thought, everything that there was to see. When there becomes children involved, it really becomes much more of an emotional piece of the, of, of the whole picture. And as you think about that and seeing young kids, it, it does have an impact of sadness and anger at the same time. I didn't think that there was anything that I could have seen that would have affected me more than that uh, until I walked into the scene at Schoolhouse Lane. In total, five children and three women lay dead. Dorothy Lyons, along with sisters Regina Clemens and Susan Uhus, had been current girlfriends of Banks, living together as part of his harem. Four of their children had been fathered by him. These were typically women who he had found on the street, who might have been homeless, who came from uh, bad home lives, and George offered them hope. You know, that, that's how it started out anyway. The vulnerable women were all at least 10 years younger than Banks. They tragically felt that a shared life with him would offer a more secure future. While his harem was developing and flourishing, it worked very well for Banks. He was able to control the women, he was able to control the children, and he was indeed the man of the house of the kingdom. For almost 10 years, life at Schoolhouse Lane had worked well for Banks. But in early September 1982, after losing his job, the pressure of supporting such a growing family began to take its toll. The 25th of September, 1982, 3.30 a.m., Heather Highland Trailer Park. Having fled the first horrific scene, Banks, high on drink and drugs, had made a 10-minute drive to the home of his ex-girlfriend and mother to another of his children, Sharon Mazzillo. So when George pulls up, uh, he goes up to the door. Sharon knows it's him outside. Uh, you know, it's really early in the morning. So she goes to open the door and find out, you know, what the heck are you doing here? Earlier in the year, Sharon had won a custody battle for their five-year-old son, enraging Banks. As she opens the door, she notices George is holding the assault rifle. And at that point, he shot her at point-blank range in the chest she died almost instantly. Pushing his way past the now fatally wounded Sharon, he continued on inside the trailer. George Banks got in there. He shot his son. He shot his girlfriend. He shot his girlfriend's mother, who he absolutely hated. He shot one child who was not his child but who we later learned had made fun of his child for being half African-American. With his savage spree escalating to new heights, Banks exited the horrific scene. You know, at this point, as far as George is concerned, he's killed everybody in the home. Uh, he even says something to that effect uh, out loud as he's leaving the house. Uh, you know, I've taken care of everyone here or something along those lines. But unbeknownst to George, uh, there were still two more people in the house. The two boys, 13-year-old Keith Mazzillo and 11-year-old Angelo Mazzillo, had been hiding out in a cupboard and under a bed. Both were able to sort of peek and see what happened. So they actually saw some of the killings. As police descended on the scene, 
the two boys confirmed they had just witnessed Banks kill their family in cold blood. They went inside, they, they saw all these bodies laying around, all this blood everywhere. Seeing a, a, a child dead on the floor, uh, it, it's, it's overwhelming. I've seen you know, hundreds of dead bodies over the period of time. I've gone to autopsies, but that whole thing, really, the massiveness of it is, is just something that makes it stand out above the rest. Most spree killers are selective and methodical. Uh, they target particular individuals whom they believe are conspiring against them to make their lives miserable. And they want to get even with them. They, they, they want sweet revenge. A spree killer remains in a state of frenzy, probably because of his mental illness uh, that makes him hyper and, and agitated uh, and depressed all at the same time. Having shot a further four dead, Banks left the trailer park physically and mentally exhausted. Banks took himself to a nearby park and fell asleep. Partially, some of this will be because of the cocktail of alcohol and pills that he'd taken, but also part of it will be an adrenaline come down. Obviously, in, in killing his partners and children, it would have been a highly stressful situation. He would have been full of adrenaline, serotonin, free histamine. When that subsided, you will feel drained and fatigued, and you will need it to have, to have literally collapsed and rested. Just over an hour into his killing spree, and Banks had so far brutally wiped out the lives of 13 people and committed what is known as a family annihilation. Family annihilator is an individual, usually a male, who believes that death is better than life for his family. If a relationship breakdown is imminent, access to the children are a problem, we tend to find in family annihilators that they will murder the mother and children, sometimes family pets, and then sometimes obliterate the family home. Or in some cases, it's broadened out to extended family members in other residences nearby. At around 5.30 a.m., Banks eventually woke in the east of the city, still armed and dazed from the night before, the killer headed back into town. Daylight's breaking over the city. You have all these law enforcement officers uh, searching for George everywhere. We had no idea where the suspect was at that point in time and if there was anybody else on his target list to go after. So that really put a lot of panic in a lot of people. You know, who's next, what's next, we gotta find this guy. This time, Banks traveled straight to his mother's house. The 25th of September, 1982, 5.30 a.m., Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania, just three hours after 40-year-old George Emil Banks embarked on what became known as one of America's worst ever spree killings. The body count stood at 13 dead, including five of his own children, and the Wilkes-Barre police were nowhere near to catching him as they struggled to find a motive for the attacks. Thirteen years before his spree, in March 1969, after spending seven and a half years behind bars for his part in a botched armed robbery, 27-year-old George Banks had been released back into the community to start a new life on the straight and narrow. Slowly, after several years' hard work, Banks began to get his life back on track, with a growing family, including several girlfriends, and a property of his own in Schoolhouse Lane. Despite his previous felony, Banks had managed to get a job as a watchtower guard at the State Correctional Institution in Camp Hill, Pennsylvania. For him to you know, be convicted and then become a prison guard um, and have tower duty, I mean, that's, that's, that's pretty good. 
as a prison guard, his duties were in the tower. He was the guy who, who held the gun, who watched over the yard, he watched for escapees. You know, and he, he really thrived in that job. It was a job he enjoyed doing, and it was a job he was good at. Regardless of his seemingly stable existence, in the summer of 1982, at the age of 40, Banks' life began to unravel. George started acting very strange. He went and got himself ordained. Uh, he started keeping a, a journal about his life. Apparently, while he was up in the tower uh, down at Camp Hill, he was um, uh, talking about uh, you know wanting to shoot everybody uh, down in the yard. So obviously, things were really beginning to unravel during that period of time. This didn't go unnoticed by the prison. Uh, he started making comments like, you know, sometimes I think about shooting myself in the head while I'm up in my prison tower. So they put George on sick leave to seek psychiatric help. The truth behind Banks's fragile state of mind was actually far worse than authorities had suspected. So at the same time George is dealing with these things at work, He's also preparing in the back of his mind. He's thinking there's going to be a race war, that this is something he has to prepare for. What he experienced as a child growing up and the racial prejudice that he experienced is something that uh, became part of him and um, something that he could not shed. And as a result of that, as life went on, um, his views became very distorted. So he begins hoarding ammunition. Uh, he starts reading Soldier of Fortune magazines and you know, doing different things like that to prep himself for this war that uh, for some reason he thinks is uh, going to come. The 25th of September, 1982, 5.30 a.m. Metcalf Street, just three hours after the killing spree had begun. Having woken in a field in the east of the city, a heavily armed but dazed George Emil Banks arrived at his mother's house. So when George gets to his mother's house, uh, he goes inside. She, she can tell there, there's something not right, and he just begins blabbering uh, about everything. He says, I killed my family, uh, I killed everyone. And, you know, his mom's listening to him, but at the same time, she knows uh, all these weird uh, things, <laughs> how George acts. Uh, it, it's nothing that's escaped her. So she decides to call Schoolhouse Lane to try to speak to one of his girlfriends. Telephone rang, and I answered the phone, and it was George Banks's mother on the phone, and she started talking and saying that George had told her that something terrible had happened at Schoolhouse Lane. George grabs the phone away from her. The officer tries to tell George, "Well, you know, the kids are alive. Uh, you didn't kill them. They're still alive." I came to the quick thought of just saying. Well, yes, we're trying to take care of the children. We're trying to get them to the hospital. And he said, I know I killed them. George said he didn't believe it. It was a lie, and he slammed down the phone. We didn't know if he would kill his mother or kill himself or what would happen. Nobody or anybody else was in his target zone. The police frantically established his mother's address and raced three miles across town to her house on Metcalf Street. Let's go, let's get there, and let's apprehend him. But whilst en route, Detective Zardecki learned that Banks was again on the move. We immediately regrouped to go to House on Monroe Street, which we were understanding to be the place where George was held up. With the police now closing in, Banks had fled his mother's house, managing to escape only a few miles away to the vacated property of a friend. So once he's at uh, Monroe Street, uh, George knows that the police are going to come for him sooner or later. He gets prepared, he, he barricades all the doors, and in an unusual move, he, he places all these mirrors uh, around the house. He, he puts them where, you know, some people say, oh, he wanted to see if, you know, law enforcement was sneaking up on him. Other people suspect he did it, so his image would be cast there to draw away snipers. Uh, he, he was prepared, as he would say, to die. He was going to die there. He had his gun, he had extra ammo, he had this uh, fortified home uh, he had put together, and he was ready to die inside of it. We had no idea what to expect on Monroe Street. We. Uh, didn't know if he'd be locked in a house, if he was gone in to kill himself, if he had hostages. Uh, there was just no idea what to expect. 
Detective Zardecki remembers arriving at the scene and being faced with an unpredictable situation as a standoff commenced. Tension was huge at that time. Didn't know, would he come out firing? Would he shoot himself? All of a sudden, we heard the smashing of the glass. And I looked up there at that window, and the butt of the rifle was coming through the window. And we heard this ranting and raving and screaming. And George started screaming at us, he's going to kill everybody. We dove underneath the car and just tried to talk back, to calm down. You know, talk to him. We want to talk to you, George. We want you to come down. He would go on about his kids, and he didn't want his kids to grow up in this white, racist world. And much of his conversations and ranting were in that, in that mindset of about the racist world, the white racist world, didn't want his kids to grow up. We kept trying to convince him his kids were alive at that point in time. Banks question to the police, are the children still alive? Indicates to me that he had very mixed feelings about having taken their lives. Finally, Detective Zardecki and his team had an idea for the motive behind the spree. By killing his children, Banks thought he could spare them the torment of the inevitable race war, a perceived battle that he had supposedly endured throughout his own life. His attitude about race overwhelmed his thought process. Um, he perceived that his children may be generals in the racial war. Um, he had um, planned escape routes from Wilkes-Barre where he was going to store food. That um, at night he would uh, go out in Wilkes-Barre uh, dressed in black with a rifle and pretend um, he was part of this racial war. George was preparing for the standoff because as he would later say, he wanted to die. You know, he, he had killed all his children, he had killed his family, he had, you know, as he would say, saved some of them from this race war, and now he himself was preparing for death. Uh, he had it in his head that these law enforcement officers, that they were out to get him. At 7.20 a.m., with Banks cornered, police attempted to contain the situation. They knew George was armed, they knew he had a lot of ammunition, and they had to deal with the situation and try to do so without anyone getting hurt. George Banks that night was wearing a T-shirt that said, uh, kill them all and let God sort it out. Well, we came all the way over to this area, and at that point in time, we moved up into here, and I remember I had Detective Mitchell and Detective Tesoy were on the corner of this porch and I was laying on the ground at that point in time. As police began positioning themselves around the siege building, more and more bystanders descended on the chaotic scene. We started having people all back in this area, cars were coming through, all on the other side back in that area. We had people coming through, new structure coming down here. There were people and news media all over the creation. At, at times, it was really almost a circus atmosphere. You have uh, approximately 150 law enforcement officers were on the scene. You had state police, you had local police. Uh, you had law enforcement officers from all over the county responding to the scene. One hour in, and an end to the siege seemed no closer. Banks remained in a position of control over the officers below. We had people literally who were in harm's way, that had no body armor, that had merely rifles or handguns, that could have been picked off very easily. He was a trained sniper. Uh, he could easily take people out, and he would later say, you know, he had more than one officer within his sights. By 8.15 a.m., Zardecki and his team knew they had to somehow open up a line of communication if they were going to end the standoff. We were here for several hours during the whole siege, and we went through a series of events. So they tried to speak with him over the bullhorn. Uh, you know, he wasn't responsive. Uh, sometimes he would yell different things out the window at him, but he didn't really respond as far as, yes, uh, I'm going to come out. At one point in time, uh, I went to a side phone, to a side house over here, and made a phone call to try and talk see if I get George on the phone to try and talk with him at that point in time. But we weren't able to do anything with that. At 9 a.m., Banks's mother was brought to Monroe Street. Then we had his mother. 
from back into the crowd up over into this area to be able to get in the way that she could talk to George. Not even his own mother talking over the bullhorn could get him to come out of the house. Almost two hours into the siege, and the police were beginning to run out of ideas for how to get Banks out alive. Many spree killers take their own lives. First they get even, and then they commit suicide. But George Banks' standoff with law enforcement may have been intended to give him what he couldn't do himself. Uh, he wouldn't drop his weapon. He'd go out in a blaze of glory. He'd let the police do what he couldn't do, and that is to take his life. He kept threatening to kill himself because of killing his kids, and we kept trying to convince him that they were alive and to keep him talking. In a desperate attempt to end the situation, it was decided to once again play up to Banks's apparent concern and confusion over the well-being of the children he'd just shot. Pat Ward, a young presenter for local radio WILK, remembers receiving a call during his daily broadcast. Then the telephone rang, and our reporter in the field, Bob Leidig, asked me to do something on behalf of the Luzerne County District Attorney, Robert Gillespie. He asked me if we would modify our broadcast to indicate that George Banks, in fact, had killed no one. We came up with the idea of trying to say, well, let's do a radio broadcast. Let's see if we can get somebody to do it. And uh, Bob Gillespie, who was district attorney, arranged to have the broadcast done and to actually do an interview. My first reaction was, is he crazy? My second reaction is, we've got to do this. There are lives at stake here. While Bob was setting up in the interview, I had a big boon box at that point in time, and I would be within distance that George could hear the interview and hear this live interview that his children were in area hospitals, that they were being taken care of, they were, didn't know the condition of them, uh, but they were alive and in hospitals. At 9.58 a.m., the fake news interview was broadcast live across the county. The children are alive, they are hospitalized. And George Banks was listening. The 25th of September, 1982, Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. Having shot 13 people dead in a ruthless spree, ex-prison guard George Emile Banks had barricaded himself into the upstairs of a two-story house on Monroe Street. Below, a circus-like crowd of press and public watched on as police tried everything in their power to draw him out safely. At 9.58 a.m., in a last-ditch attempt, a fake radio news broadcast was played out over a speaker, stating that the children Banks had just shot were in fact alive and needed his help. The children are alive. They are hospitalized. But to their dismay, Banks remained defiant. Although he listened, we didn't know what was really going through his head. We could only hope to surmise or try to hope that he had some belief in what was happening. He kept saying, I know I killed them. But at the same time, uh, I think a part of him wanted to believe that, that the children were alive. The radio broadcast appeared to have failed, and police knew they needed to end the standoff before more innocent lives were lost. Remember, George yelled out, it's a good day to die. I heard policemen yell, we have them in our sights. And I'm thinking, are they going to kill him? But the police were not about to oblige this killer with a quick exit. My instructions were, do not kill this person. Let justice, let the justice system do its job. The police feared that they had run out of options to end the standoff peacefully, until to their surprise, a former prison work colleague of Banks pushed forward from the crowd. 
His name was Robert Brunson, and he knew George well from the prison. And he volunteered to talk with George. And uh, he said, George, you know, he said, uh, you need to come out. I, I won't let them hurt you. I'll put myself as a shield between you and the law enforcement officers. But you need to come out. For whatever reason, uh, none of the other tactics worked, but this one did. George agreed to give up, and he was going to come down the steps and out of the back of the house and meet Brunson at that point in time and hand his gun to the people outside of the house. At 11.17 a.m., four hours after the standoff had begun, George Emil Banks finally gave himself up. At the time he was coming out, he didn't have any expression. There was no sign of any expression to anything. He just looked straight forward, said nothing, and just got him cuffed, got him to the car, and got him out of here. Almost 10 hours after beginning his merciless killing spree, George Banks was in custody. As we went upstairs to the detective room, we sat George on a chair, and I remember handcuffing him to the chair. And I walked out in the hallway, and I started to quiver. The adrenaline had gone. I became extremely emotional, and I just thought, wow. The 6th of June, 1983, Luzerne County Courthouse, Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania. Banks stood trial for the murder of 13 people. The youngest was just under two years old. I can tell you the first time I met him was at the county prison, and um, he was in the library. He was not shackled, and there was no guards, and it was just me and him. He could have came across that table on a moment's notice and killed me if he wanted to. He didn't do that. He was very respectful. He was thankful. I can tell you from the first day I saw him to the last day I saw him, he was always alert, calm, very considerate. He sat, he looked, he listened, and when he wanted, he spoke. At some points, uh, as George is talking about the crimes, at some points he would cry. Uh, at other points, he would become um, solemn. It, it was just this mixture uh, of emotions that he would display. Um, he believed that his children uh, were going to die from some type of a racial onslaught. And he killed them uh, to protect them from that onslaught. The turning point in the trial came when Banks took to the stand. Against all advice, he revealed shocking images to the jury from each of the crime scenes. Before the trial began, I told the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania that I would not allow them to admit any of the pictures because I felt uh, that they were so inflammatory that they might be held against Mr. Banks. Um, those photographs were overwhelming. Um, anybody looking at those photographs, I mean, you would want to kill the person immediately who did that. The jurors, I think, were just aghast. Um, some of them, you could see, they were starting to cry. When George put those pictures in evidence, that pretty much sealed his own fate. On Banks' 41st birthday, and only 16 days after the trial had begun, the jury unanimously agreed to a verdict. He was given the death penalty on 12 first-degree murder convictions. He was found guilty and he was sentenced for third-degree murder. He was found guilty and he was sentenced for, I think it might have been attempted murder, aggravated assault, theft, and robbery. 
I remember I was sitting there in the courtroom uh, crying, and uh, he got off the stand, and you know, he just walked over to me and just put his hand on my shoulder, and then just sat down. As Wilkes Barre struggled to recover from the devastating spree, one question remained. What could have driven a man to commit such chilling crimes? When an individual such as Banks, who is paranoid, and that chronic behaviour of alcohol and, and drug misuse can bring out the darker side of an individual. In his case, it made him quite unpredictable and prone to rages, and I think it unleashed the acknowledgement within him that his family were now a burden, and he couldn't find another way out. The thing that stands out to me more than anything is how fragile the human brain is in the, the different homicides of the many I've seen over the years, what, what sets off people? I just couldn't imagine how anyone could do that. And, and going in and looking at my children sleeping peacefully, and, and to this day, it bothers me. I do not believe that Wilkes-Barre will ever forget that day. More importantly, I don't believe that Wilkes-Barre should ever forget what happened that day. I'm not the same as I was uh, 30 years ago, that's for sure. But it changed my life, there's not a doubt. It definitely changed my life. What I wanted to accomplish in the sentence I think I've accomplished, George Banks is going to die in jail of natural causes, or he's gonna die in the being executed, and he'll never, never walk the street again as a free man. <laughs>